meeting in order. It is uh, March 11th at just after 7.15 p.m. in the Select Board Chambers. It is a meeting of the Select Board of Arlington. Uh, quick introductions, all the way to my right is Selectman John Hurd. Immediately to my right is Selectman uh, Joe Kiro. I'm Selectman Dan Dunn. To my left is Selectwoman Diane Mahan, and to her left is Selectwoman Clarissa Rowe. We are joined by our professional staff, Town Manager Adam Chapdelaine, Town Council Doug Heim, and Board Administrator Marie Kropelka. Welcome, everybody. I did not prepare a quote today, unfortunately. So, first up, opening of Robin's uh, Town Garden, May 18th. Patsy Kramer. I have colleagues with me. Do you want to take a take a second to take a breath? Or? Yeah, right, right. So we are wanting to give everybody a heads up on the save the date for a garden party celebration of the restoration of the um, fountain and the reflecting pool in the town gardens, as well as the restoration of the Dallin statue. And we all, Jim, too, represent five groups that are very involved with this, co-sponsoring the party, and all of us have both a love and an interest in the garden. The, I represent the Garden Club and Town Hall events, Jim, obviously, the Dallin, Christine Harris, the, uh, the Friends of Town Garden, and Joanne, the Historical Commission. The uh, party is going to be Saturday, May 18th, 6.30 in the garden, because obviously we're ordering up good weather. Uh, the MC will be Nathan Robbins, a.k.a. Alan McLennan. We are going to have, he always, you know, he, he did a reenactment of Nathan Robbins in the, the hearing room, Lions hearing room, a few years ago. Uh, we're also going to have a reenactment of the Robbins sisters. We're going to have um, cocktails, of course, and tapas, and some speeches. Um, we also want to certainly make note that this is such an achievement from the town, from the, the uh, CPA money. And it's something that never would have happened if we didn't have that kind of money available. Everybody loves the garden. It's such a, a, a jewel in town, and we really hope that people will come out. Now, CPA will, not, will pay money for a, a restoration of a garden, but they will not pay for a party. <laughs> so we're going to have to ask people to buy tickets for the party. So would anybody like to add anything? I'm just proud that the fountain, again, is going to be working and that there are new plantings in the garden that are improving it. And so that's a big achievement, I believe. And we're really excited to be working on this um, with could, the town. Could you come on up to the mic? Thank you. Oh, sure. We've been working on this with the town for a little over a year, and we've also been working to plant a bed on the side of Town Hall, which you'll see. We're hoping this, this is the first step in a series of moves to bring the garden back, and we're really, really excited about the friends. Would like to invite you all to join us. Anybody who isn't a member is more than welcome to become one. And uh, we're very excited that this is happening. Really, really excited. Thank you. I never refuse a microphone. <laughs> 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 no, but the, uh, the Cyrus Down in Art Museum, of course, loving that statue of, uh, by Cyrus, the Monotony Hunter. Um, we are so delighted that it's been restored and that the pool now will be working. And so we are going to try to help Patsy and the rest of the committee here to uh, sell the tickets and anything else we can do to uh, participate in the event and look forward to uh, that great uh, afternoon. Great, thanks. We hope you'll come. Thank you. Clarissa? Um, I just want to give a shout out to Jim Feeney our assistant town manager who was on site at all times, yes. double checking everything, and he is just a wonderful asset for this town. And I give him a lot of the credit in terms of, well, the designers, of course, the engineers, and but he has been our man on the job, and it's wonderful, and it's a lot of it is because of him. Absolutely, it's been wonderful to work with. Good, yeah. good. All right. Thank you very much. All right, next up is our consent agenda where we approve everything on a single vote unless there is somebody who wants to separate one of these. If you are here to speak to one of these items, say you're looking for some free, ad free advertising, come on up to the microphone right now. 
Um, consent agenda, minutes of meetings, February 25th, 2019. Special one day beer and wine license uh, from uh, March 19th at the town hall for the chamber annual dinner uh, from the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. Uh, special one day beer and wine here at town hall on March 23rd for Beats for Eats fundraiser for Arlington Eats. A uh, special one-day beer and wine license for March 30th here at Town Hall for the Hardy School Silent Auction for the Hardy School PTO. A request a special one-day beer and wine license for 331 uh, in the, here in the Town Hall for a private event, Kathy Cabrera. And a reappointment to the Board of Youth Services of Justine Block. Anybody here for any of these items? Move approval. Second. Second. Um, motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Approved. Next up, license and permits, common victory license, uh, Villa House of Pizza, 1367 Sumenda Shretta. Come on up. Welcome. Why don't you come on up to the microphone and teach me how to say your name. Good evening, everyone. This is Sumenda Shretta. Uh, we just uh, bought the uh, Pizza House of Pizza effective March 1st. Uh, Business plan is under the review with the Board of Health, and we have applied for the uh, Board of Selectmen. So here I am. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so existing business, any big changes or similar or? No, is, is as usual, same same as yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Move approval, and I have one question. Uh, I've got a motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, I, everything's great. My husband's there every Friday night. Um, yeah. I just <laughs> want to double check that you're going to be closed on Mondays? Yes. Yep. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you meant that. Okay. That's fine. Sure. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any further questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Five zero vote. Thank you. Welcome to Arlington. You're welcome. Thank you. Next up, for discussion and approval, authorization to execute consolidated revised community host agreement with uh, Apothka Inc., previously known as the Massachusetts Patient Foundation, and providing a letter of non-opposition. <coughs> uh, start with town manager Adam Chaplain and Town Council Doug Heim, and uh, then I'm sure we'll get to the to uh, Apatka. Oh, uh, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the memo that you have in your desk is in response to some questions that sort of came up uh, over the weekend about the process and what exactly these applicants are seeking. The folks from Apatka, as the board will recall, are operating a registered marijuana dispensary in Arlington. Uh, following your vote of non-opposition, as well as your vote to uh, authorize a community host agreement back in February of 2016. Since that time, lots changed. So recreational use was legalized. The town voted to adopt both, uh, to adopt a zoning ordinance regulating marijuana, uh, recreational marijuana and medical marijuana. The uh, Board of Health promulgated regulations, and while the zoning, uh, the zoning bylaw is still under review by the Attorney General's Office, as the Board may recall under Chapter 48, it's essentially retroactively applied. So unless the Attorney General's Office uh, rejects the zoning bylaw, it's in effect now, even though it hasn't been approved yet. It's kind of a quirky thing about the zoning law. They're seeking two things. One is a non-opposition for the purposes of their medical marijuana operation at a different site. They're essentially proposing to move that medical marijuana operation and co-locate it with adult use at a different site than the Water Street location where they're operating now. Uh, they need an, a letter of non-opposition somewhat strangely for a more restricted use for medical marijuana, even though they're simultaneously applying for an adult use license, which they don't require a letter of non-opposition for. What they do require is a host community agreement. And so what they propose to do is to merge their existing obligations under their host agreement for the registered marijuana dispensary with a host agreement for the operation of adult use retail. Um, these folks did come in. They met with us to confirm that the location that they're proposing uh, what was in keeping with the zoning bylaw and the various buffer zones that were established at town meeting back in December. They've also been before the board not that long ago uh, to propose a different location, and the message was more or less that they, they wanted to move previously, but the message was more or less sit tight while we were figuring out <coughs> this uh, zoning matter. So with that, I'll answer any questions the board has, but also let these folks speak for themselves. Diane? Um, I just have, I think, three. Um, 
the request for both recreational and medical sales. Do they have that now, or is it just medical? Ms. Mahan, right now they just have medical. It's medical. Okay. Um, and then I was just wondering on, I understand it's the Cannabis Control Commission, if I'm reading this correctly, that sets the uh, 3%, no more than 3% fee. Do you know how they arrived at that, or that's just, they studied it like crazy, and that's the number? You know, Ms. Mahan, I don't know how they arrived at that number. I, I know there were a number of hearings about that process. Uh, the previous toast agreement that we executed for the registered marijuana was at 3%. I'm not sure if it was just the sort of common number that a lot of communities had arrived at under medical or if there was a larger policy discussion at the state level about it. If they can find like a short answer to that and just shoot it to me and my colleagues in the email, if that's appropriate. I could help you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please. Hi, I'm Philip Silverman. Uh, I'm an attorney for uh, Apothka. This is Joseph Lakash, the president of the company. Uh, that was actually a legislative decision. Um, previously under medical, um, there was no requirement of a host community agreement at all, although a lot of towns subsequently started doing them. And they were trying to sort of figure out what makes sense. You know, there aren't that many uh, businesses that come into a town that are actually required to pay impact fees at all. But they felt like they wanted to be sort of proactive here and to take the community's interests at heart and try to figure out what, what makes sense. They also didn't want to go too far with it. Um, and so they set that limit, 3%. It's somewhat arbitrary. Um, I can tell you, you know, if you were to go out to a lot of the other states that have implemented these types of programs, they don't really do this. They kind of think it's uh, quite protective of the state here. I don't think it's a bad idea, at, but the idea is it only lasts for five years, those terms, and then you go and you reassess. You look and say, what, what impacts did it really have? Did we have to run out there all the time? Did we have to do a lot of extra inspections? Does 3% really make sense? So there are places that are doing somewhat less than 3% um, in the state, but what we recommend to our clients is just, let's just do the 3%, let's you know, be as protective as we can and proactive about it. If it turns out less, we'll deal with that in a few years when we renegotiate. Okay. Thank you. And then my last question is, maybe both gentlemen, um, around the um, annual financial audits. Does the town have any ownership input in that? Is it chosen by Apocrypha? I'm not going to say it right. And if it, if it is outside it's chosen by them, is there any in-house town audit or Powers and Sullivan audit that just not, not, you know, pervasive or anything, that they just go through and say, yep, it looks right? If you'd like, sure. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening, members of the board. Um, so basically, we have very, very stringent reporting requirements already in place. Prim Funny enough, we report more stringently to the bank than to anyone else. Uh, they see daily sales and monthly sales by location. Um, and so we would share that with the town. Um, it is a true and accurate accounting of our sales. And the 3% is calculated on gross revenues, not anything else. So there's no deductions from our end that are allowed to calculate it. So it's the easiest math, uh, thankfully, to be able to do. Okay. And just maybe a follow-up. I don't know if it is appropriate that through the town manager um, when we get that, I assume yearly or if not more frequent, who should that go to just to kind of give it a quick look over? Yeah, or or we, maybe we, you we might can... decide we don't need to do that. That's just going to be a waste of people's time and effort. I, I would think top line verifying the gross revenues match up with the, um, <clears throat> the fees that we receive is the most important thing for us to look at. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but we can discuss whether or not maybe we would ask Powers and Sullivan, the comptroller, or somebody else in mm -hmm. town. Who, who would be the best person? We, we, can, we can discuss that. And I just want to say, I'm just asking these questions yeah. just for information. I'm not Perfectly intimating reasonable. anything. Okay. Thank you. Do we have, so uh, other questions for Doug about ground rules? Before? Um, why am I just getting this today? Uh, you think you put that one on me? Uh, he sent that to me, uh, early, well, I think he wrote it, or, I don't know exactly when he wrote it, but okay. it was sitting in my inbox for several hours, and okay. I did not pass it along. Okay. I just, I think this is an important decision to make, and I, I getting this kind of information as I sit down makes me um, grumpy. Er. <laughs> er. <laughs> just, er. just what what we tried to do. Actually, sorry, I'm gonna. Please. Yeah, I, I will, I'm gonna try to get the ground rules out of the way, and then I'll invite you to, to talk. I, I so I, I think it's, uh, I and I imagine other people had sent some questions to Doug after yeah. about the agenda, and, yeah. and he answered some of them, and it uh, 
I did not get to it till like. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I think this kind of this important kind of document shouldn't be. It's not your responsibility to get it to us. I think we should be getting this information on Friday afternoon at the earliest so that we have it in our hands. Because I think, you know, I actually I called Adam today to ask him some questions as well, and I think that the you know the first pot shop that we have in town is going to be something that people are going to be looking at very carefully. I think we have a good careful process in hand, but I need, I can't vote on something that when I get this kind of memo in my hand as I sit down. I'm sorry, but that is just the way I feel about it. Okay. Uh, questions about the ground rules before? Uh, John. What is it? I'll reiterate a similar concern that I found out about this agenda item on the Arlington list, and it was I had no real for you know pre preparation to talk about this tonight, and I was just reading this as Doug was talking, so I'm a little yeah. I was trying to so do both. we aren't under any obligation to act tonight. Uh, so when I get uh, um, I put the ag agenda together. Some items I know about long beforehand. This one is not one that I knew yeah. about long beforehand. Uh, I put it on the agenda. In retrospect, could I have written it to not even put it as a pot potential vote for tonight? That might have remo removed some of the ambiguity. But uh, doing it, tailing it, it, is within our purview. Yeah. Regardless, but I mean, I wanted to put it on the agenda and start the conversation regardless. Yeah. And I'm happy to hear what has to be yeah. said tonight and see if we get there. Yeah. But I'm not prepared right now because I don't know right now what we're voting on. <laughs> so I'm, I'll listen. But that's just where I'm at. John. Oh, I'm not going to say I'm not prepared to vote either for, for all the reasons that stated, but I, I did have a question. Um, this is a big decision, and we are limited to three of these establishments in, in town, so I'm wondering if it, through you, Mr. Chair, if I could ask, um, do, do we have a sense of how much interest there has been on the part of potential um, retailers? So including Apotheca, there's uh, three groups that have reached out to my office, I don't think is you know, I think it's the yeah. same, about the same number. I, I, I guess I would I could editorialize a little bit about it. I think that the interest depends on what you mean, Mr. Kiro, yeah. which is that over time there have been folks who have expressed some interest while we were still coming, where we had a recreational moratorium, um, and while we were deciding what our, where we would zone for this type of use. So when we say we have three licenses, the zoning bylaw allows for three special permits. Yeah. And um, as the board probably recalls, those special permits essentially have certain conditions on them that make that, that, that would essentially make sure that they're not all clumped together. So that's certainly a relevant consideration because there's a density sort of buffer zone so that these aren't stacked up on top of each other. Uh, there have been folks who expressed interest bef when there was a moratorium who sort of never followed up. These folks uh, from Apotheca have obviously been operating yeah. an establishment, so there's been a more constant contact. So I guess as a follow-up question, I, mean, I guess what I'm rolling over my head, I realize that these are, this is not a license per se, but, but I am thinking back to when I first got on the board and we opened up two more um, uh, liquor store licenses uh, for, for availability and there was a whole rush of, of interest there. We had a, a process laid out on the board where we heard from each of the applicants and actually chose the, the two applicants that we thought would, would best meet the criteria that we had um, we had set out. I mean, is it permissible for us to follow a similar process um, with this, or are we required to entertain, you know, any requests for uh, letters of? Uh, well, I guess we don't have to do a letter of non-opposition unless it's the medical, right? So that's your special case, I guess, Apotheca. Um, but I would assume we wouldn't enter into host community agreements with, with more than three. So um, is it the first three through the door? Or are we going to consider a process that the board will put out to give a certain period of time for those who are interested in pursuing this to come forward and then and we would uh, go through it? I think that's a good question, but I th uh, and I think we would be well served to hear both from them and some of the people in the audience because I got a phone call from uh, uh, the, another one as well who said, hey, what's going on Monday? Can, and yeah. who, who I see in the audience who I suspect will want to come up and talk. So okay. uh, I think that's a great question, but can I, I think we should listen for a while and then sure. tackle sure. it. Okay. Uh, Doug? Yeah. I, I just, 
If I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I do want to do want to note that the law with respect to host community agreements, a host community agreement is required, as is a community forum, before a license can be obtained from the state by any applicant. That being said, there are some details of this process that are quite distinct from your process for a liquor license. And the most important one is, is that the zoning bylaw vests the redevelopment authority with the task to perform environmental design review, and very specifically to make certain thing, determinations officially about whether or not something is uh, cited in the appropriate area, um, whether or not the buffer zone uh, might be waived or altered for a specific applicant at a specific site. So it, it, is a it is a little bit more of a complicated process in the sense that you are the only real arbiter of who gets a license for, for an alcohol license, whereas this does involve permitting by another entity um, that's very specifically related to things like site conditions, parking. And it's a little bit difficult because other communities and towns have slightly different government structures. And so it's not, there's, there's not a perfect analogy to what's going on in Arlington. Um, I'm wondering about the sequence of decision, though. Can, can I, can we yep. put, gather information in the, or yes. uh, actually, sorry, why don't go ahead and ask a question. I, I just, I, you know, what is the sequence of de decision? If we're voting on this before the environmental review, mm -hmm. I'm thinking to myself, hmm, that doesn't seem to be the right order of things, just in terms of principle. Unfortunately, I think that is the order of things. I think that the host community agreement, unfortunately, just like with the registered marijuana dispensary, unfortunately mm -hmm. has to come first because otherwise they can't start the licensing process. Once the licensing process is start from the state, to my understanding, they can, in parallel with that process, start applying before the Board of Health. And this is true for any applicant, not just these folks. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can parallel go before the Redevelopment Board and the um, Board of Health I mean, they're all assuming a certain amount of risk for any of these types of things because of it. Uh, but I, I don't think that the way the law is structured, and I am mindful of the fact that sometimes the state assembles things in a way that's not perfectly suited for how uh, we conduct business locally. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a difficult thing for us to have to cope with, but I think they'd have to start with a host community agreement. I don't want to put words in people's mouth, but I don't see how else we could do it. Thank you. More ground rule questions? No, you were going to kill me. I'm no, no, no. A quick let's, one. let's do it. Um, it's up to three, but we're not bound to give out three, are we? Or is it, it, is it in the process that as long as they check off all the checks, then we have to? I'm, I'm, I want to know how much say we actually have, a majority of the select board. So there are three special permits, and as long as there are three available, someone can apply for those three. We can't necessarily say we're not going to give out more than one or two um, because of the way that the zoning bylaw is written. Uh, the, certainly, there are certain things that would, that would make it easier or harder to have one, two, or three, but I don't know that those are necessarily considerations that are sort of host community agreement considerations. They're, the sort of zoning issues and the availability in what's sort of on the market for, for someone to, to rent. Or Promise purchase. last question. It's, it's a yes or no if you want. Um, and I'm not saying this is the case, but if whatever falls down the road, is there a vehicle, a mechanism that if a majority of the select board deems fit, that we could impose a temporary and or long term moratorium? Or, or if you want to think on that and get back to me. So uh, as a yes or no question. Oh, no, you can say whatever you want. I'm just okay. trying to, you know. Um, what I would say is, is that the board has uh, the authority to put on, the board has the authority and always has to determine whether it will allow for recreational use and whether it wants to restrict the number of licenses below 20% of the number of uh, package store licenses. So the board does have the authority to limit it to under three. That might be in conflict with the zoning bylaw, but I would say if the board went through that process and put it to the voters to restrict the number, the board could take the initiative in doing so. Done. Thank you. Ground rule questions? All right. Welcome. <laughs> well, 
welcome. So. Thank you. Okay. We just got it. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> Please, we understand. You can also pepper us with as many questions as you want. <laughs> uh, we actually sort of covered quite a bit of what I was going to talk about. What we're really here to do is to talk about two things. We're talking about taking the operation, which is now at 11 Water Street, and moving that medical operation to 1386 Massachusetts Avenue, uh, which, quite frankly, is a better location, has more parking, uh, more street parking, and, and its own parking, um, and also doing a adult use marijuana retail establishment at that same location, 1386. We would then close down, we wouldn't operate out of 11 Water Street anymore. Um, so, but, but you know, it might help in terms of talking about why we think uh, this makes sense uh, for you. I, I might just let Joseph talk really about what's gone on so far because I think we're sort of a known commodity and we've already been working with you. So why don't you just talk a little sure. bit about what's been Good evening again. Um, so I've been before this board numerous times, but this is the first time I could actually say I'm here with an operating history mm -hmm. in the town, uh, which is very exciting for me. I, I think that one of the first things I said back in 2015, because I think we first came at the end of 2015 to this board, um, was we really wanted to work closely with the community. And I think that as Mr. Chapdelay and Mr. Heim can attest, we've done just that. We've really engaged with all the different required boards of the, of the town, We're part of the Arlington uh, Chamber of Commerce, um, and we, I think that we've gone above, above and beyond in a lot of that engagement. Uh, we have, I think, a great working relationship whenever there's anything that we need to speak about, we're able to do it. Uh, there was a good three-month time period where I think I spoke to Pat Martin over at the Board of Health more than my wife. Mm -hmm. um, so Pat and I have become very, very close in terms of trying to figure this out together, you know, untested, Board of Health regulations and how it applies as, as we're working through it. I've got him, we've done three-way calls with our compliance officer, for, our former compliance officer from the Department of Public Health, so on and so forth. Um, we've met with a lot of the different law enforcement officials. My, my director of security is sitting in the back looking a little brooding, um, which is good for a security guy, but um, we at this point also had most if not all of the Arlington PD by our dispensary to look at our security protocols, see how we've set everything up to be a safe operator. And I, as far as I know, we've gotten no complaints, um, which, is, which is obviously a positive operating this. We, take, we don't take lightly the fact that we, are, that we would be the first adult use dispensary in the town of Arlington. We didn't take lightly the fact that we were the, and are the first and only medical operator in the town of Arlington. We've taken that as really a mantle for ourselves and we're trying to create a very, very high bar for whoever comes after us. And I think that that's where we've reached. So with this request that we have for approval of both the host community agreement for the new location as well as the letter of non-opposition, it's really just expanding what we're doing within the community that we've gotten to know really well at this point. Um, we're excited. <laughs> we, I could tell you that it's still, even if we get approval tonight, it would still be a six to eight month process to, until we are able to open our adult use doors. Uh, I could also tell you that our Lynn location, which again is also the first and only dispensary in Lynn, right on the Linway with 50,000 cars a day driving by, uh, thankfully no, no issues there either, uh, but that location will likely start adult use in the next 60 days, co-located with our medical. That was applied for in August, so kind of gives you, gives you the, the idea of the timeline. So we're gonna have ex uh, a lot of experience from that location in a much higher traffic road with dealing with things like parking, traffic, um, and really serving both patients and customers um, that will apply to whatever we do here in Arlington should the board allow us to move forward. Also, from a structural perspective, with the H if the H uh, host community agreement gets approved today, which the host community agreement as proposed just goes straight to the maximum uh, payment allowed by state law, which is a 3%, it calls for a process to ensure that two locations do not remain open at the same time. So the, within the host community agreement, it clearly delineates how there will only be one operating at any given moment. Um, with that being approved, if it's approved, uh, we would then have to host a community, agreement, a, a, a community meeting within six months of actually submitting our application, which is kind of why host community comes before community meeting. Um, and then we have to apply to the state. We'll get, because they have to, yeah, you know, they have to do it. We're gonna get RFIs on our application like we have for everything else. We'll respond to that. Then once they deem the application complete, it's a 90-day shot clock to actually grant or deny a provisional <coughs> license. Uh, during that time, we would be applying for our special permit with Arlington Redevelopment Board, which would 
we would have to show all of our parking and traffic plans as well as the environmental study and everything else that's required of the special permit. Um, once we have the provisional license, we would then also have to schedule a follow-up inspection with the Cannabis Control Commission. They would come in, then they would recommend us or not recommend us for a final license. Once we get the final license, they come and do another inspection, and then they recommend us or not recommend us to the commission to begin sales. It's a very, very long process post these meetings, um, and it's one that we had to go through in a very different way for the medical license, and one that we'll go through you know, with open eyes for hopefully an adult use license. Thank you. And uh, just to sort of follow that up and really sort of close up, the, the, the host agreement that we're talking about, what we really did uh, was we modeled it, we took it right off of the medical one that you had already approved. It's not really all that different. Um, the operation, uh, you know, there are some state regulatory uh, differences in terms of how you let customers in and checking identification and such, but they don't really impact the host community agreement. So the only real differences you're seeing in this agreement are some references to state law. The prior one referenced medical, this one references the uh, adult use uh, uh, regulations. So that's really it. Other than that, it's the same, you know, preference for local hiring, local companies. Um, it's the same, it's 3%. I believe, have you passed the 3% tax, sales tax on retail? Okay, so that's not part of the host agreement, that's just uh, part of your, your local uh, rules, so we would be paying that as well. And um, other than that, it's largely, like I said, the same agreement. Uh, I'm going to take questions from the board, but uh, there's something that I actually meant to do totally separate from this topic that I meant to me announce to the people who are here. If you're here for the hearing on uh, the Indigenous Day warrant article, mm -hmm. that article's uh, been withdrawn and we're highly likely to just recommend no action when we get to it. And I meant to do that up front at the beginning of the meeting in case anybody was waiting for that specific article. And uh, I apologize for only coming to it now and um, interrupting. Who withdrew so, that? We didn't do that, did we? No, it came from... Um, it's the people Human proposing Rights Commission. it. Human Rights Commission. Right, yeah, yeah. I just Sorry. want to make sure they yeah. know that it's... Yeah, it was withdrawn. So I apologize for the delay and the interruption. Questions from the board? Diane. Um, how long have you been operating out of Water Street now? We opened in October. Okay. And I haven't heard a peep, so that's good news. It's um, good. <laughs> and, and just more, as you say, you now have history and um, a track record. Um, I do see in here it said... Um, you'd provide the town by January 15th of every year with uh, the financial audit. And then um, you also cited, um, you would also provide any additional DPW financial records that you have to submit to, mm -hmm. I mean DPH, I have DPW, public works in my head. Um, my question is, um, do those documents exist since you, it's been a relatively short period of time, but have there been additional DPH financial records that have been generated? No, in fact, the DPH doesn't, doesn't actually require any financial records, uh, apparently. Um, you, could, you could contradict me, but um, we have not submitted our, uh, an annual uh, financial record to the town for two reasons. Uh, we're going to, we were planning on doing it next year to encompass a full year of uh, uh, financials. Also, there was a $100,000 payment made as an advance against the 3%, uh, and I can tell you we've gotten nowhere close to using that advance yet. So I guess my sort of overall question would be, you're saying right now it doesn't exist, but you do state in here that um, if you all have to provide additional financial records, if the operator has to, that to DPH you also would provide. You, you're Correct. Gonna on, right now you're saying not, nothing exists, no process. But, exactly. Okay. I just want to know if it existed now and you t tell me what the form is, I'd keep it an no, eye No, and, and it doesn't, but like I said, I, I, you know, the, the, the sales records we submit to the bank, I have no problem sharing that also with the town. Wow. And um, you do or do not have delivery now? Uh, we have delivery in, for, for people with a hardship. So okay. we haven't had to do it yet mm -hmm. uh, from, our, from our location, but yes, we do have the delivery option available. And I'm assuming with a lot of the due diligence you spoke about, that somehow was coordinated or communicated um, with the town manager vis-a-vis -vis the police department. Uh, so whenever, so there's strict regulations when it comes to transportation of marijuana, either from our cultivation facility in Fitchburg or for home delivery. Um, our vehicle has been approved by the Department of Public Health, which is 
you know, just for clarity, the Department of Public Health no longer administers the medical program. Now it's the Cannabis Control Commission. So I'll just, from the going forward, I'll just say CCC. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have the vehicle approved by the CCC, and ultimately it's the same kind of regulations in place for home delivery that we have as uh, transporting from Fitchburg to any one of our locations, which means we need to have two agents in the car with the cannabis at all times. We have to have a predetermined yet randomized route uh, for any deliveries that we make. There has to be a transport manifest generated, which is uh, a nice long process to do. Um, we have to, we have a GPS enabled monitoring within the vehicle at all times and not through a cell phone. It actually has to be a built in thing. Uh, we have secondary locks. So the side doors of the vehicle are completely shut uh, permanently. And the back we have not only the trunk, uh, let's say cargo van trunk lock, we have a secondary lock there and inside built in another third lock for a cage. Um, we have to have constant two-way communications while the vehicle's in motion, and it could only be delivered to the actual patient or their care or the registered caregiver. So we would be following those same instructions uh, in, on both sides. Just uh, by way of information, uh, this what we're talking about here is the medical program. Mm -hmm. Just so that you know, uh, on the adult use side of things, home delivery is not yet allowed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I guess in going forward, uh, Ms. Rowe outlined, you know, maybe we are. Mr. Carroll, any one of my colleagues, I can't remember who said it, um, that that's the kind of thing, if we were going to set up a process, you know, similar to when we do um, alcohol process, um, that would be like one of the things that I'd want to have that information in front of me, you know, what is the proper um, way, route to do delivery and ensure something like that. Um, well also, just to add to that, mm -hmm. as you're going through the process with the state, they require all these standard operating procedures to be submitted to them as part of your second stage of the application, the management and operations profile. And then when they come to do your actual inspections, you need to have it fully fleshed out or they won't approve you. So any applicant that comes before you, if they actually do want to open, because I know a lot of people who have gotten through the medical process and have been, not, haven't opened in two years, uh, three years, no hopes of opening, um, Anybody who's going to get operational will have to be in full compliance of the CCC regulations. And I can promise you, it is a very arduous process and very, very complicated to stay in full and total compliance to the point where we've had two surprise inspections in Arlington and both times, thankfully, our inspection reports have come back completely clean. Okay. And if, if, but if you wanted uh, copies of the information that gets filed with the state and the application that covers this, we're happy to provide yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll provide ours. You can give it to Mrs. Kropelka and then just the daytime job in me. Are you now saying DPH is now CCC? So the Department of Public Health as a state agency so continues. Yes. No, continues. Yeah. The medical program has transferred from their purview to the Cannabis Control Commission's purview. And what my question is, um, some of the uh, guidelines, bullet points outlined here, are all with DPH, but I'm hearing on at least some of them, it's now CCC. Does that need to be reflected and adjusted, or does there need to be language in there? He was saying, like when I said about if there are any additional financial records um, filed with the DPH, I think it's like the fifth or sixth point. Um, it will also be provided to the town, but then what I think I'm hearing is that particular facet of it is now under CCC. And I'm not saying for you all. I'm saying if mm -hmm. we do get someone that tries to look for a loophole, should that be reflected in here? Um, sorry, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, so... There are two uh, agreements in front of you. One is the agreement that they signed in 2016, and the other one is the new proposal. I think the new proposal is all up to date, so that all that information would, is, is citing the appropriate statute, or it's referring to it uh, as its sort of like predecessor, just so it's clear that mm -hmm. anything that was required under the previous agreement is going to be required under the new agreement as well. So we definitely make sure that, we take, that that's taken care of, Ms. Vaughn. Yeah, because I'm just saying, if you wanted to be a stickler, of course. And if I found out or any one of us found out a different business that did have to report records, which previously would have gone to DPH, I'm now hearing goes to CCC, and they didn't provide us with it, they could say, well, it doesn't say we have to do that in there. I just want to make sure we're covered. Um, and it sounds like we're going to come back and vote this another night unless I'm, you know, not hearing things correctly because I have more questions. I just want to make sure everything's buttoned up there. This are you looking at, just to be clear, are you looking at the 2016 or the 2000, the, what, what, is it dated 2016 at the top or 2018? Um, I'm actually looking at 
16. Okay, so the 16 is the one that we already the approved? Already approved. Right, but I just, since we're going to be entering and adding the Anything extra use. we would make sure it matches. Yeah, I just want to make sure. And then, um, I think I know the answer to this, but um, where you're moving to another location, I don't anticipate anything. I know there's language in here from your current establishment, and if it's successful, you're transferred to another um, establishment. If any um, public safety, health, or any other issues arise, it says the operator shall um, be responsible for that. But then uh, do I also read, you're not responsible financially. If a cost was incurred, it comes out of the initial $100,000 that you had to give for Water Street, or do you give? Are we, are we talking about the uh, impact fee? Yeah. Well, so, what I'm saying is one of the paragraphs near the end says if there's any public health, safety, or other effects um, of this proposed establishment, the operator will be responsible for that. And then when I try to follow back to see where do you state that money comes from, I that's think part, that That's part of the 3% impact fee of okay. gross sales, and that's every year. I could tell you that also at our current location, I think we've had one police response, and it was before we had any marijuana. I saw these big boxes inside with a little red button, and the kid in me can't help but press a little red button. They were active panic alarms. I had no idea. So we had a response then, and since then we haven't had a single thing. Okay, thank you. Questions? Um, I, I went down to take a look at the proposed location, and I noticed um, I used to spend a lot of time there. It used to be my bank um, location. Um, there's an ATM, and I assume you're taking that ATM out. Is that correct? Uh, so that's actually up to the landlord and their lessee, the Bank of America. Uh, the Bank of America. That's going to be completely up to them. Uh -huh. um, it's we're technically renting the space just on the other side. Right of the door. on the other side. Yeah. So it's it really is up to Bank of America. I would imagine. I have no say in that. And if it does go away, um, we were, what we have right now in our current Arlington dispensary as well as our Lynn dispensary. We have an ATM on site that, ha that charges no service fees. So people would be allowed to use that. Maybe that could be worked out before you come back again. It, Maybe you could work that out and figure out what, what it, you put. It, it's honestly not going to be up to us. It's going to be up to Bank of America more than anything else. Um, it's, it really is up to them, the ATM. We, we, we don't have the ability to tell Bank of America to take, take it. No, no, but the landlord does. They, they do, they, no, they could choose not to, the landlord could choose not to renew the lease. Right. Um, but that doesn't happen In two happen years, till, three years. Yeah. I just, I think having an ATM there, if you really think it's important, then tell us why it's important. Uh, we're, this is a federally illegal business, so we have no access to, to the credit card networks. An ATM is very, very helpful uh, because that's I how see, our patients. because you have to. Yeah. Everything has to be in cash. Correct. And the cash, check. from a safety perspective, just so everyone is very clear, we work with Century Bank. We have deposit accounts with them. We don't sit on cash. That goes to the bank account. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm learning your business. Sure. You know? yeah. And by the way, for open invitation to quite literally any of you. Um, no, I have no problem giving you a personalized tour of our dispensary here, Lynn, or the really cool tour, which is our cultivation campus. It's a 26-acre former Bayer Pharmaceutical campus with 10 different buildings. Can you give me the addresses both in Lynn and Fitchburg? Absolutely. Uh, Lynn is 491 Linway, and Fitchburg is 99 Development Road. And I'd be more than happy to take anyone uh, to see any of these locations. I do work in both places, so I'll, I'll drive by. I'll I, I, drive I've been by. putting an insane amount of miles on my car in the last few years. <laughs> Questions? Well, I, so I, if it helps, my th plan is to exhaust questions here and sure. then see who else we have to talk. Well, no, I was, I was going to actually ask the question about the cash, because I remember that was an issue um, uh, when, <coughs> when you first came in, and we, we were concerned about the security there. And I, I'm just going to editorial, editorially say that... Um, I think it's no secret on this board that I've been kind of skeptical about this law, but it is the law and it's kind of the will of, will of the voters, but I appreciate the level of preparation and the thoroughness of the answers you brought here. It's Thank you. really helpful. Thank you. And, Thank and you. like I said, feel free to ask any question about any facet of the business. I live and breathe this every day. Phil does as well for multiple clients throughout the state. We're here to inform, educate, and really, you know, just be with you guys. Thanks. So, um, I'll, I'll just, jump in if you're not. Uh, I actually, mine um, is more editorializing than actually a comment, which is that um, I was telling Adam the other day that a month ago I made I went and I made my first legal purchase in Massachusetts, and so I 
made an appointment at the place in Salem. And uh, it was, you know, January, it was, uh, it was cold, and, but, uh, and I was able to park not too far away, though they did have a shuttle bus from a different location. And I got there, and they had a detail from the Salem police, and they had their own security guard outside. And the uh, security guard would, every few minutes, you know, call it 10 minutes, 15 minutes, he'd ask for people who were there for that particular appointment. And I was there like 15 minutes early, and I got in with the, you know, the, the group that he was bringing in about 15 minutes early. And then they let you into this anteroom, and in the anteroom, um, we wait in line, and they're checking the ID of each individual person and checking the appointment again for each individual person. And then in a group, they let us into the actual room where the sales were, and we actually waited in line. And, you know, they had, I don't know, call it two medical te tellers, and I'm going to say six or eight uh, adult use tellers, and you wait in line, you end up in... Um, made your purchase with cash because it was the only thing available. And for me, for my particular purchase, they you know put it in the plastic bag and then they sealed the plastic bag. Then they put like a, a, a I don't know, it isn't exactly a safety seal, but a tamper seal so that they know that you're not opening it like while you're still there. And then you know you walk out another exit door. So like that was my mm -hmm. experience. Um, yeah, for whatever sort. Yeah. Well, I, I actually visited the same dispensary. Yep. I would like to ask that you know, if we get approved it to open up adult use, that you be the first in line for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> that'd be amusing. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I've also actually made a legal purchase in uh, uh, Montreal, and it was a very similar experience, except it wasn't appointment. But other than that, it was it was the same. So, but just to be clear, so again, standing out on the street or standing at the ATM, you're not seeing. Merchandise. You're just you're seeing like somebody right. checking IDs before you, before you. And, and that's actually a very good point. Yeah. I mean, whether it's adult use or medical, um, you cannot see any marijuana products from the exterior of the building or from the waiting room. Um, you know, you walk into 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 the Arlington Dispensary, um, and you have to get checked in through the state system. There's a pretty door, but you, with frosted glass that you can't see into the actual dispensing floor. Uh, similar situation in Lynn, and really everywhere else. It's part of the state regulation. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, even when evaluating other candidates for, uh, for the rest of the, of the potential licenses, just know that a lot of these security requirements are state mandated. Um, and the Board of Health here, honestly, has even further requirements, which make it a little bit more. Um, and everyone to be able to open is going to have to be in compliance uh, with a lot of these, with all these regulations, which are very cumbersome. Any immediate questions? Uh, we'll have another chance. Could I ask you, thank you, could you two please take your seats. Uh, other people here who want to talk on this particular issue? I see Mr. Leone standing up. Welcome. Good evening, John Lawrence, attorney in Arlington, representing Steve Steve Bell. Bell. Stephen, um, his partner, Tom Gossin, who's in the back there, are um, asking initially that the board not make a decision on this particular um, application tonight. They've also been very right. interested. Yeah, sorry, uh, Mr. Lanny, could you get closer to the microphone? Sure. But, yeah, thank you. They were also interested in opening um, in Arlington, and they've actually located a place up in Arlington Heights, which would be within the buffer zone. Um, they've been in touch with the manager's office since early January and have been dealing with the um, redevelopment board as well, and they've been searching places throughout the town. One of the problems they've found is that a lot of landlords will not rent because um, marijuana income would affect their mortgages, and it would cause their mortgages to go up. So there's very few places within the buffer zones and that are available for rent, retail, either medical or recreational marijuana use. So they have located a place, and he owns the building himself, no mortgage? The current person. Yeah, the current yes. landlord. Yes. And so it would be available, but we're with, they're about 700 feet away from where the applicants are going. So we would ask that the board give them a chance to come on the same time, present their business plan, their proposed host agreement, and sort of like we did with the, med with the um, second round of liquor licenses, have everybody within that zone come at once, see who's going to give the best deal to the town of Arlington, and then the board can give their approval to it and send us all on to the, um, the zoning boards to get that secondary special permits. So they had, do have experience. They have associated with um, the Northeast place. alternatives in Fall River, Mass. 
<laughs> okay, so unfortunately, there are millions of people at home, and you okay. guys are standing yeah. with the ah, microphone okay. between we're, you, and you need to. Sure. Yeah. We're affiliated with uh, Northeastern Alternatives out of Fall River, Mass., which has uh, currently medical, um, adult use, and um, a grower facility. What does affiliated mean? What, like, are you a, we it's have, a franchise or? It, well, they're our consultants. Let's, let's, so they help us with all our operations and all our, you know, the ins and outs of the day-to-day -day operations. And do they have a, in, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, yeah. do they have a store in Fall River? Yes, they currently have Where, a, What's the address? Um, 999 Rhode Island Ave in Fall River. <coughs> All these shops are in places that I work, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You might know someone in Fall River. Yeah. yeah. We're not asking you, to, obviously, to, to um, give any recommendation, pro or con, for them for <coughs> that's to allow them to present at the same time and give the board full and fair between the various applicants that would be available for the Heights location. Why don't you give one out? That's going to eliminate what's it, 2,000 square, 2,000 mm -hmm. feet in either direction. So. Okay. I've got at least three questions, but as usual, I'm going to defer. John. Well, it's not so much a question, but this is more along the lines of how I thought the process would work. And so I would support tabling this to the next meeting because I think of the people that are interested, some might have just not known that we're ready to hear applications on this. Um, and just, you know, I know it's different, but I had anticipated that this would work like the liquor licenses where we say, all right, you know, we want you to submit your host agreements by this date and then we can look and and look at them all in conjunction with one another and because it's both the entity the location and like they're saying if we bump if we approve one and bump another one out then it could be you know it, it's, it's unfair I, I don't think the process is fair to do that um, I would bet that more than two or three people will come out of the woodwork in the next couple of weeks if we say that we're now ready to hear these applications. So, All right. so um, uh, so I guess, uh, have you ever drafted or proposed a host agreement before? Yes. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> yes. Uh, was it with uh, with uh, with other? Uh, so you're operating somewhere else, or trying to operate somewhere else, or we just got approved for a growery in Lakeville, um, so that's one of the host agreements that we just got. Okay. And have you started conversations with uh, Arlington about the host agreement with the, with Doug or Adam, or is that we've had conversations with Adam. We we have a complete package ready to submit. Um, we intend to submit it tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so that, okay, that you took care of the third question then, I think. Um, question number two is, uh, if I understand the location that you're looking at correctly, uh, it has, there's question, or in fact, I, mean, I don't think there's a question, it's within uh, the buffer zone of a park, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so, okay. Um, other, yeah, uh, so, I, I've, I, 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 there's a discussion, are there other questions for this? It's got to be down there. Sorry. Yeah. No, I didn't know whether. If you can ask them if they want to. I mean, I don't know. If I don't know if you can say the. Or you know, you tell know, us not the location. location or? I'd rather not give the exact location at the current time, but okay. there is a but park. But you will tomorrow. It, it's on a I paperwork that we submitted. Um, okay. So right, Marie, shoot, shoot us all an email tomorrow. <laughs> the address, please. Yeah. The, there is a um, a park that was not on the original yeah. zoning map that. Uh, I know where on the I overlay, so they put it on the second <laughs> version of that map. So when we started this process, we were unaware that it was on the second yeah. overlay. Um, so I think we should have a discussion, but before we do that, do we have any other questions for these two gentlemen? All right, why don't you two take a seat? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anyone else who wanted to apply today? All right, seeing none. All right, so uh, towards the end of tabling it and how, well, what process we do or don't want to follow. I just, um, I also, when my first reaction was 
identical to what Joe said, and uh, it's similar to what John said, which is that, uh, like that, the bake-off we did of the multiple alcohol licenses, I think, really did really well for the town. Yes. We're going to have a difficult time reproducing that exact thing because mm -hmm. we don't get to decide about, about things like license. buffer zones, yeah. and we don't get to decide things about environmental review. So we're going to be able to. We'll bring in, we can bring in our best possible information and we can do our best guess, but in the end, like right. the, the ARB has, you know, just as much, if not more, yeah. swing over this. Mm -hmm. So this bake-off, that any bake-off that we try to do is going to be... Right, and the Board of Health, too. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's... I know it's different. It yeah. just, I think this is a fair process that we're talking about, and I think it, you know, this is all new, and what happened when we were doing the liquor, which happened over a period of about 10 years, is the process changed and um, sort of morphed depending on what kind of information we were getting. We first did um, two liquor stores in East Arlington, which was a mistake, and then we realized that we shouldn't be doing that. So I think that this process is, is new and should be slow and considered. I don't think you all want to hear that, but I think it's it's what served us well with the liquor um, rollout, and I think it would serve us well with this. This is, you know, I know that we're, I mean, for me, this is putting the cart before the horse, and we're the cart, <laughs> or no, I guess we're the horse, yeah, pulling the cart, and um, but we don't have enough knowledge to, to really know what it is. And I think I would like to see the people that are interested in front of us with what they're going to give the town so that we have a good track record of, you know, what, I mean, you're, you've worked in the town for a little while. That's a good, that's a plus for you. Um, I think that there are other businesses, you know, what, who grows the best marijuana? Is it Lakeville or Fitchburg? I have no idea. <laughs> you know, but I think could be up in Canada. Yeah, it could be up in Canada. Um, my daughter lives in Colorado, so I or I already know about this. <laughs> no, you can't. can't. <laughs> but I think it's. I just think that it needs to go slowly and carefully. And I know this is frustrating, but I think it's the right way to do it. Um, like John, I was stunned to get. <laughs> to read on Saturday that we were deciding this today because I hadn't heard about it. And I'm, you all don't know, but I'm only here for this meeting and one more meeting. So you won't have such a um, curmudgeon sitting up here. The, the, next, no, sorry, no, sorry. No, the next person that sits here may, may be somebody that also, I mean, I will try to, whoever wins the election, I will try to tell them about the deliberations. But I think it's a, it's a learning process, and it worked well with alcohol, and I think it's got to work well for marijuana as well. Uh, John and then Diane. Well, I should hope the two candidates are watching. But yeah. Yeah. So is our only role in this to, to approve the host agreement, and then beyond that? It, yeah. Correct. Okay. And what, what's the, so with liquor licenses, if there's a violation, it goes back to us to determine a penalty. What's the penalty, or who polices it for a violation for marijuana? So, uh, Mr. Hurd, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Two sort of enfor main enforcement mechanisms would be the Cannabis Control Commission itself, yeah. but also our local Board of Health. Uh, the Board of Health approved regulations that enable them to take certain actions if there's a, depending on the type of violation. And then, depending on how severe it is, if it's a serious violation of the special permit that's granted by the ARB, there would also be potential consequences there. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to reiterate what I already said, but I think the correct course of action is a motion to table so we can get all the information in front of us. Diane? Um, and honestly, with all due respect, I'm not trying to be sarcastic. Um, where this is something new and something very important, and I know will generate a lot of discussion in a lot of different places, you know, community forums, if not stop and shop, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, et cetera. Um, and knowing my nature and my colleagues' nature also um, of wanting to have as much information, you know, there's no such thing as too much. 
So as well as establishing a process, I will say for myself personally um, and for all my colleagues, in situations like this, like with alcohol, we start off, but I'll speak, speak I, I start off with all things being equal. And then to see, you know, how that rises and, and different proposals differentiate themselves if all things are being equal. And um, I would tell you my personal opinion is a large part of my decision would be uh, sort of check, checking off in my mind the veracity, authenticity of any proposal that comes before me. And one of the things that really gets my goat, I hope that's a good thing, I don't know if I can say that. Um, I, can. I can, okay. <laughs> She's my fact checker sometimes. Can I say that word? Um, is if um, any applicants, uh, say during the alcohol, all alcohol hearings, come in and I see they're giving me the bare bone minimum um, and or if I ask a follow up question and I get back that, well I wasn't required to give you that. All things being equal, I will take that into consideration. So what I would say to the, any um, applicants, um, you definitely have to do what's under the law, you know, and, and the minimum and what I would say to, through the chair to the town manager and town council, since we are tabling this, um, Maybe if there could sort of be, I mean, I understand we're just the first checkpoint and we really have a limited role, but we do have a role and I want to take advantage of that. So um, if there's any, I guess if there's anything I should not inquire, um, you know, under the law, if you want to send me that. But um, I'd like to see lots and lots of information as well as when you're at the microphone, you gave me the, a, B, a to Z, one on delivery and, you know, what it encompasses, what it entails, what the state regulations say, what you do. You know, I almost, I don't want to be a delivery driver, but I feel like I could do the job um, from the explanation. Um, my husband wouldn't like that. But anyway, so I just want to put that out there. Um, whatever the town manager, town council thinks, um, this select board um, should have it a bare minimum from each of these applicants um, and or any guidelines, anything I shouldn't step on, let me know. But to any of you all submitting um, requests, your submission and, you know, and your response at the microphone, um, all things being equal, plays very important with me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I definitely get the sentiment for more, slower. Uh, does anyone want to talk? I'll second, Mr. Is that, was that a motion? Or? Motion to table. Second. Uh, with that, is there any sense of uh, what pace or timeline people think might be appropriate? I, I would suggest it be, not that I don't want to vote on it because now I'm beginning to understand it, but I would suggest that since you're going to have a new select board member, that the next hearing be after that person sitting here. So, and I will make every attempt to tell both candidates about our discussion tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's important that they be part of the process. Um, and I, I would think they'd want to be. Yeah. Okay. And they can go on ACMI and yeah. stream. So they, I would suggest definitely you tell them too. But yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'd tell them to stream. It's <laughs> yeah. That's right. Okay. Uh, so I'm just trying. I'm trying to think in my head of like a little bit of, about a time frame that we think is reasonable for us to get what we want, but also is you know helpful to the people who are applying. I would say for me, the next meeting is fine, but but other than separate from yeah. Clarissa's reasoning, okay. so if that's the reasoning, I just want people to to know ahead of time that it's on the, like yeah. the gentleman in the back who would have rushed his application. In. And whoever else is thinking about it, and if there's other people that are interested and they're not ready to get in in this round of applications, then that's fine. But I don't need any extended time, just not tonight. <coughs> Adam? So based on some comments that Mr. Hurd made earlier and then based on what um, Ms. Rowe just mentioned, perhaps we could put together a process that lays out what we're looking for bring that back to the board at the next meeting on the mm -hmm. 25th for consideration so that we can then put out a call yeah. for applicants, for lack of a better term. And then that would likely run until there was a new board yeah, member great. seated so that any ultimate decisions in vetting could be done by the newly seated five I think members. That's a great idea. 
Okay. Just looking ahead to our schedule, we know that we've got a meeting on April 17th, and we know we've got a meeting on April 22nd, which is the beginning of town meeting. Mm -hmm. So really we would either be doing it in late April or <coughs> sometime in May. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, feedback from either of the, oh, sorry, Joe, did you have something for us? I, I would suggest that there are probably two, two steps involved here, though, that we want to have a discussion by the board of that process first as, a, as its own agenda item on a, on a meeting before bringing applicants back. So as opposed to just putting out a call for, 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 for interest, I think we want to adopt something in, in writing so that it's very clear before that call goes out. Um, yeah. And we've all, we've all agreed on, on how we're going to conduct ourselves there. Yes, and any applicants will understand what those ground rules are before they, they answer a call to, mm -hmm. to apply. Ideally, it would be Ideally, it would be an amendment to our policy manual, but it could be a written, you know, set of procedures that we adopt for this time. Okay. Is, it, with, with all due respect, I, that's I think that's what I proposed. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. That, okay, I, bring I something back to the next. I meeting. apologize. But, okay, I apologize, Doug. If I may just clarify something, I, I, I think this is clear. But the call would be for any establishment anywhere in Arlington, both medical and. Recreational, so we're not necessarily confining it to the sort of area of real estate that these folks are concerned to, but no. abroad, Thank abroad, you. basically, these are all mm -hmm. folks that we want to see interested in opening an island, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And can we legally say up to three versus three? I don't. Uh, I don't think so, Ms. Mon. Okay. We have to say right. three. All right. Uh, any input from any of the speakers earlier? So, that, so we'll be back to talk about process on a April 25th. Mr. Leone. Excuse me, John Leone. While speaking with my clients, they also invite any of the board members who wish to tour either their facilities between now and the eventual um, hearing dates. Get in touch with me, and I'll put you right in touch with Steve. You'll get me an address this time? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep, please. Uh, the only thing I would say is um, a lot, uh, whenever we've gone through an RFP process um, prior to opening, it was a lot of operating procedures that would be in place. Uh, now that we're open, our operating procedures are codified in a very, very long and thick book. Um, the state has, does not allow us to transmit those digitally uh, for, I'm sure everyone can figure out why, mm -hmm. because it has a lot of security protocols. Uh, that would likely be our, our, our key submission, how we're actually operating. Uh, so I would request that um, as part of this process, allow us to give each of you a paper copy that you would return after the vote. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be my only request. That's yeah. Doug. Mr. Chairman, we'll have to talk about it. Uh, once we <coughs> receive something <coughs> public <coughs> record, we may be able to withhold that public record. I'll have to speak to the supervisor of public records. This is obviously a fairly unique and sensitive situation with respect yeah. to security plans. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you'll be able to collectively work it out. Yep. All right. Um, I did, so we have a motion from um, Mr. Mr. Hurd and uh, seconded by uh, Mrs. Mahan. And we are going to table uh, with the intent of coming back, not specifically for the hearing on this particular proposal, but a hearing on our process, uh, process at our next meeting, which we will also attempt to set a schedule for when we bring back this particular application. Further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero vote. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for all Thank the you. information. All right. Now we get to warrant articles. And our first warrant article of the day. Sorry. It's uh, pulling up the file. That I need is it the tw is it twenty seven? Twenty seven, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Seven. Time limits. Time limit for time meeting speakers, Mr. Leone, or Michael go Yeah. Hi, John Leone, uh, town moderator, chair of the town meeting procedure committee. We did meet with um, Michael, Michael Brown, Kobe Brown, town meeting member from Precinct Seventeen. We met um, on March. Fourth, we've sent you our minutes. Um, the general feeling of the board, I won't read the minutes, you guys have them already, but the general feeling of the commission was, um, this is a solution in search of a problem. 
We don't really think we have. A you have to be right in, right in front of the yeah. microphone. You've got to get a better mic. I'll talk. No, to it really should. No. Really, Mr. Leone, you just have to point it at your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, um, we believe it was a, prob a solution in search of a problem. The, the, the feeling of the committee was that most, if not 90 plus percent of the members speak for two or three minutes. The ones that do speak for long either actually have something really good to say or they are a member that takes a couple minutes to warm up. <laughs> and the other problem the, um, that, that people do go the whole time is that... Um, they'll ask somebody a question, and the person who they're asked the question of will go ahead and expose and tell us their theories of the universe for five minutes and use up all the present the person's time. So we didn't really think it was a problem that this, we needed to have this drastic a solution for, seeing that we used to be 15 minutes, then 10, then seven. We didn't, we didn't really feel we wanted to go down anymore. So we voted no action. Um, I had offered to Mr. Brown that I would help him draft a substitute motion if he prefers to go forward with his um, article, and I will work with him so it will be in the proper form for the bylaws. So if you have any questions of me from, regarding the committee, um, I'm here. Otherwise, I'll defer to Michael. Yeah, I have a question to you in your sure. role as moderator. Yes. Do you um, intend to recognize as the... Um, the main motion, the uh, recommended vote of the um, procedures committee or yeah. of the board? We actually discussed that as one of our issues. Um, <clears throat> we felt that it would be proper for our, main, our motion to be the main motion because this is really a town meeting article and it affects town meeting itself. We felt that the, if the board wished to opine on it, you can, but we thought that it would be something that the executive branch shouldn't get mucked up in the legislative branch's business. So it's your, your intention then to, as a moderator to recognize that as, as, yes. as, as the... Yes, our motion is the main motion. That's why I was going to defer to Mr. Brown okay. with an amendment. Okay, and, and um, my second question is, I, I, I don't know if we discussed this or not during the first round of, of hearings on this. Was there any consideration um, you know, given by the, the committee to possibly, I don't even know if it would be in scope, that's obviously your call too, mm -hmm. But to, to possibly re remove the specific reference to time limits from the bylaw and, and instead specify the town meeting will vote their, their, their adopted time limit at the beginning of each, each town meeting? No, um, we didn't discuss that. And frankly, I kind of like that we do have limits in the bylaws because um, otherwise we'll be debating each meeting debating the time yes yeah. yeah it would be the and you would get the folks who want to get up and talk for 15 minutes and the people who want to talk for two and we'll end up at seven yeah. um, what they did discuss and we were going to explore by paying attention this actually this um, upcoming meeting the committee members are all going to kind of keep track how many people actually go two minutes four minutes five seven how many um, times people get up and request extra time because um, and the only time that really happens is the school committee the ARB will get up and other people have substantial presentations and they'll ask for extra time and we take a really quick vote and give it to them mm -hmm. so we were going to see how much that happened and perhaps next year suggest a bylaw that just gives the moderator the ability to extend without having to go through the formality of a vote that's what we did discuss that. Okay. Ms. Rowe. Um, John, I think one of my problems and the mm -hmm. reason I was supportive of Michael's Warren article is that I've found that there are a lot of people that get up and sometimes for every article and use their seven minutes. And I'm really tired of it and I think I'd be more apt to vote for Michael's proposal but maybe as the moderator, you could remind them that we really don't have to hear what they think about every single article. I mean, I can, I can name five people that mm -hmm. do oh, this. Oh, yeah. And Easily. maybe we're asking you to step up and ask them to please talk to them privately. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it really takes away from town meeting. And I've tried in a couple of times <laughs> to hold at least one of them back. 
-hmm. as he went to the podium yet again. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe we are leaving it in your hands. If you don't think that this is necessary, maybe we could ask you to step up and... Well, and I'd be glad to do it, and frankly, I don't call them every time they get their hand up. <laughs> Some people... Seems every that way. Seems <laughs> that way. I can name six right away. Yeah, I, well, I do keep... Yeah, I know. lists, and I, I know who gets up every time, and I'll right. intentionally not call someone if they've spoken to, because frankly, I think they lose their thunder if they get up every single time. Yes, they do. People just turn <laughs> them off. Oh, him again. Click. Yeah. Wait my five minutes, and then pay, pay attention again. I, I know I do it. Mm -hmm. And but it's seven minutes. We'll never get back again. No, it isn't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Mr. Brown, did you have a want to wait? Yeah, well, we just spent a lot of time talking about how Arlington can get high. I think this is one way we may be able to lower some of the uh, uh, temperature around here. So I think it still makes sense. Uh, I think if someone has something to say, they could say it just as well in five minutes, then seven minutes. And in respect for the 200 or more people who are at town meeting, uh, they often, like me and many of you, have to get up the next day and go to work. And uh, I think we can uh, have a good democracy in five minutes just as we could in seven. And so uh, uh, I think it makes sense. Thank you. Other members of the public who wish to speak on this issue? Mr. Wagner. Hi, can you hear me? It doesn't sound like it's even on when I'm doing don't an Elvis. Don't hold it. Yeah, you don't want to. Don't hold it. So, uh, oh, actually, sorry, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Carl Wagner. I'm a town meeting member. I uh, live in Precinct 11. And uh, I, I wasn't planning to come here for this because I'm much more concerned about Article 41 before you. However, I thought I'm relevant, uh, and I'm, I, I wanted to just let, remind you that collectively I petitioned the board uh, maybe 10 years ago for the time cut from, I think it was 10 or 15, to I asked for five. And collectively, the board at that time uh, walked me through why seven would be better. And when I first heard of Mr. Brown's uh, proposed article, I thought, well, seven's been working fine. But I talked to distinguished member at Kuro, and, and he pointed out that even the support of this group to go forward with this will still put it before the body that has to be inflicted by long speaking people anyway, town meeting. So I guess uh, I can see why it sh it, it's okay if you support it, although I would probably say seven that you recommended when I suggested five worked fine. It seems to be working fine. I'd also like to give you some feedback in those 10 years that I've been going or whatever it is uh, to town meeting. Uh, the, the process, I think, improved. We get out statistically faster, I believe. I, I, I know Mr. Dunn keeps a good web site that, that tracks a lot of stuff. I think you could see before we were like three weeks, sometimes more. Now we're two weeks, I think, almost all the time. So uh, the, the members who volunteer for town meeting are getting through the business in a faster way. And it's not been my experience that left or right, up or down political policies are being missed because uh, we're cut down to that amount of time. So uh, thank you. I did want to say one suggestion that I hope the people of Arlington will pay attention to. Um, it's not an attack on the moderator, but I would really support a published list on the screen of who is speaking in what order. One reason is that I am usually the guy who gets up and says, I motion that we stop talking. Sometimes I actually want to get up and say something that I think is useful that hasn't been contributed yet. I worry that I'm always going to be seen as the closing guy, and I also don't feel that sometimes when my hand goes up, I'm actually called on in order, because sometimes I'm held off to be the guy who can be put in as the closer when enough debate's been heard. So I would strongly suggest that the people of Arlington and town meeting members who watch this insist on a published list on the screen of uh, the order of the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. My one editorial comment is, we did it in four nights last week. I wouldn't count, uh, last year, I wouldn't count on it this year. <laughs> That's a long warrant this year. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, 56, Adam Street, and former town meeting member, and one of those who talked quite a bit, um, but I don't think on every article. I, I object strongly to this uh, proposal, and I do so uh, for the simple reason that often the things that come before a town meeting are too complex to... Um, express an opinion on in merely five minutes. I think it's relatively rare that people go the full seven minutes continuously every time they speak. Um, and I think there's also, there's also a power dynamic here, and that is that town officials, those representing town boards, are far more likely to get the courtesy of additional time when asked for it than town meeting members are. My first, the first time I spoke at town meeting, the uh, time limit was 10 minutes. 
I think I asked for an additional 10 minutes, maybe it was an additional five, and I was granted it. I didn't know anything about town meeting. If I ever tried to do that today, um, coming as a guest, or if I was elected, that wouldn't happen. Um, and in particular, some of the zoning articles are very complex, and I think they deserve the extra time that a presenter might need to present on them. I would respectfully submit that if there are any town meeting members whose time is so very precious that they can't spend you know, an additional two minutes per speaker, then they're probably in the wrong position. Um, I, I think town meeting members deserve the courtesy of their colleagues to have the time that's needed. And as the previous, previous speaker spoke, the town meeting has a, has a mechanism for dealing with that, uh, and, and he's well aware of it, and, and I think you are too. Any member can move to terminate debate if they feel it's going on too long, and I believe that's the appropriate solution to this problem, not to limit those speakers that need um, seven minutes. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who wishes to speak on this one? Someone chair to make, care to make, Mr. make a motion. Mr. Carroll. Well, I, I am going, going to make a motion of favorable action for the reason I do want to, I, I, well, ideally I would have liked to have seen it go before uh, town meeting, but I, I do support it because part of what I'm concerned about is not necessarily the folks who are in the room. I'm concerned about the folks who aren't. We, we thanks to so many of the improvements the town meeting procedures committee has put in place, we saw a real increase in the competitiveness of town meeting races. We used to have so many seats go mm. unclaimed, um, and it was it was tough to get a full a full 252 um, town meeting members. I think with the electronic voting and some of the other um, improvements, the consent agenda. I mean, I think it sped things up. But now this year we've started to see more more unclaimed seats, um, uh, uh, seats that nobody's running for, and. Um, it concerns me, and I worry that, that it's partly because folks have gone through the process and, yeah, they, they like some of the, the improvements there, but, but it really is. Uh, they've taken your advice, Mr. Lordy. They've decided not, not, not to run, but it makes it so much more difficult to recruit people to come and serve the town, so consent them. Yeah. So we have a motion for... Uh, I, I, I move for favorable action. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second by Mrs. Mahan. Further discussion? I was just saying that I when I first heard this, I liked the article <laughs> because I think lost, for me, it's not just the length, but the p number of people that speak when an article ends up passing, like 99% to one. Um, I don't know that since it's town meeting voting on town meeting, I don't know that they'll give much credence to what we say here today, yeah. but I would be, <laughs> I, for reasons that Mr. Leone said, I'd be, I would defer to the rules committee who handles the rules of town meeting. So if they're voting for no action, I think that's what the way the board should vote. Are you two saying the opposite? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to check. Rare, no. <laughs> uh, so I actually, uh, as a town meeting member, I will be voting if, if Mr. Jacob uh, brings forward the, the, the Ms. Brown brings forward the uh, uh, motion, I'll be supporting him. But uh, I agree that, it, like, I, but I'm, I'm more or less with John that I'm, I'm, the town meeting will do what town meeting yeah, wants to do. exactly. Yeah. And they don't care what we think. Yeah. No. Uh, Joe. Can I make one more point sure. uh, too? I mean, um, I was attacked in, uh, on this for uh, supporting this. Um, and why do I want to restrict freedom of speech? Now, we have restrictions, we have rules in town meeting already. I, I would submit that by having shorter time periods, there'll be a greater appetite to hear from more voices in town meeting. That's my thesis. I, I think it actually. Uh, enables freedom, uh, enables more speech and kind of a clash of ideas within the town meeting. Yeah. That's, that's my thesis. Um, I, it's funny because I know exactly what I want to happen, but now I'm, and I'm trying to figure out what I can, what my vote to cast here that um, most advances that. And I think I've actually come around to, um, I'm going to be supporting Mr. Kira's motion. And I'm sure it'll reflect in the comments that the main motion right. is coming from yeah. the yep. proper rules committee. 
and this is just um, what we think. <laughs> Advisory. This is us opining. Yeah. yeah. Taking the opportunity opining. to opine. Yeah. Further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Abstained. None. Four zero. Uh, four to one. Excuse me. All right. Next. I thought. Our Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up, bylaw <laughs> amendment. Uh, water line replacement. Adam, is it? We go yeah, why don't we have Mike? Uh, that Great. Okay with you. Yeah, of course. Mr. Rademacher. Oh, he brought a sample. Yeah, show and tell. Kevin would be happy. Uh, <laughs> there, was a, there was a point earlier in the evening where uh, one of the people said, "In my security guy is there and back. And I looked, and I'm like, no, that's Mr. Rademacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we were also elected as the regulators for marijuana for a few minutes there, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow, that's a big doobie you've got. A, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so, I'm going to leave you, that. Uh, thank you for taking the time on this um, Warrant, uh, I'm Mike Rademacher, uh, Director of Public Works, and uh, the, the warrant, proposed warrant article is for a bylaw that would um, require home sales to go through a, a water service inspection prior to sale. Um, when I had spoken to council about this uh, proposed warrant, we, a we actually talked about both water and sewer, uh, and, and I'll let you know why. Is, as the DPW goes through and does uh, water renewal, main renewal projects and sewer repair projects, you know, we spend a lot of time and effort fixing the infrastructure in the street and, and often realize that poor infrastructure continues um, on private property. So when we're replacing water main, we'll see that there is some subpar water services going into homes. And, and we educate folks at that time and we try to make it more convenient if they want to renew. But that's a surprise to residents at mm. that time, and something they're not expecting. And and on the uh, on the sewer side, when we're doing sewer lining, trying to keep uh, groundwater from infiltrating into the sewer, so that we're not treating clean water, uh, we'll fix the pipe in the street. But then we'll still see clean water coming in through sewer laterals because they're in pretty tough shape. So uh, again, nothing we can necessarily force residents to fix. It is their private property, but it does impact rates and, and to some degree the environment, either through lost water or through sewage leaching through um, some of these um, poor, poor conditioned uh, sewer lateral. So, but for the purpose of this warrant, we're, re we're restricting it to uh, water inspections to kind of get a sense of how this would work and to um, get the ball rolling uh, as such. And, and for, I would say the majority of the sewer, um, the, uh, the uh, water service conditions are, are, are good. Uh, most residents have copper, uh, but we do come across maybe 10, 15% that are iron. Uh, and iron has a, has, a, has a shelf life. I have a sample here. This is a piece of, this is actual uh, water service line that uh, we heard leaking through um, a survey. We do surveys where we can listen to the pipes in certain frequencies usually indicate a leak. And so we found this service leaking and we informed the homeowner. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to. Uh, yeah, please. This from the pipe whisperer. Yeah. <laughs> this is listening yeah. for leaks. This is, uh, this is. Yeah, he's a. Uh, yeah. Was actually in service. Do you mind if I hold it up yeah. so that uh, we can. So Lynn can take a picture. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And. Uh, yes. It looks like you can see through it. Mm. Yeah, and, and essentially, just a minute. you know, the resident didn't notice a, a water pressure issue because the, the soils around the pipe were, mm -hmm. tack, uh, were packed tightly around it. So, you know, they were getting water pressure. But when their faucets were off, it, you know, the back pressure was causing leakage through this pipe into the, into the ground. So, and, and this leakage occurs prior to a water meter. So the town is purchasing this water and is not able to sell it essentially, uh, before the meter. Mike, what's the year of the iron pipe versus the copper pipe? Yeah, copper, I believe, is around the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, so World War II, uh, mm -hmm. between then and the, and the 70s. Any particular part of town that you know has iron pipe? You know, I, don't, I haven't noticed a trend mm -hmm. myself. Um, we, we are going through a... Um, 
we are going through a water, a water meter replacement mm -hmm. project. And as part of that, we are keeping records on the, on the material of pipe mm -hmm. we're seeing in homes. And uh, it's, a, it's about 5 to 10 percent iron. Mm -hmm. and, and during that process, if w we can't replace a meter because the fitting is so bad and corroded, we do yeah. work with the resident to see if we can get the main uh, the service line replaced. But again, that's a, a surprise. And it's worse when someone has just bought a house. Yeah. Yeah. And then we tell them, oh, by the way, we just noticed you have to spend, you know, X amount of dollars mm -hmm. to fix this. So, you know, the, the warrant is uh, twofold, uh, the proposed um, bylaw. One, to protect the town's uh, interests in, in water loss, and also to protect um, future homeowners from buying something that typically goes unnoticed. Mm -hmm. or, or un uninspected. Doug? Can I just speak for a minute about how it would work, as well as one clarification that maybe Mike could oh, make? Oh, sure. Do you want to speak to that first? Sure. Uh, I actually received a phone call today about this, uh, clarifying the extent that the resident would be responsible for under this, and it would be the same as they are today. So in Arlington and um, just about uh, all our surrounding communities, the uh, property owner owns from the water meter in the house to what's called a um, curb stop, a valve in the sidewalk, uh, which is just about on the property line. And then the town is responsible for that curb stop valve to the water main. And typically when a resident restores or replaces their service line, we will come in and upgrade the line all the way to the main so that we can get a new valve and replace any pipe that exists still. Uh, so just that's clarification. It wasn't clear in the wording of the bylaw, the limit of the responsibility, and we can maybe clean that up a little bit. Okay. I don't know if you were to, I had a, a quick, quick question. And can you give, if not an estimate, sort of a range um, that when someone's told, you know, the town goes in there and they say, hey, we've noticed and then they said, what's that going to cost me? Sure. Like, not that any figure you give is the ultimate figure, sure. but I'm just linear. Foot Ballpark, a, a very straightforward, easy um, replacement is about $1,500. Gets more complicated if you have re retaining walls or landscaping or front steps uh, in the way. But um, there is better technologies out there, so you can actually, if the pipe is in okay condition, you can run a cable through it and hook up copper pipe to one under that cable and you can actually pull it under. So you can, rather than excavate, you can actually pull it through the earth. So uh, that will reduce cost in situations where you have landscaping or uh, other above ground um, infrastructure. So I'd say, like I said, about 1500 and then depending on how long it can go up from there. Thank you. Other I have comments, but did Doug want to? Oh, do you? Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to clarify that the basic idea here is that the most opportune time that folks will have where they'll have the resources to maybe replace a line is when they're selling a home. And the way that this bylaw is structured, uh, maybe folks might disagree with that, but the way the bylaw is structured essentially require you to get a certification from the town engineer as part of your sort of municipal lien certificate process. Um, that you've had this inspected and that it's in good working order and the inspection is done by a certified plumber or drain layer. It's not done by the town unless the engineer feels that for some reason that report needs additional vetting. There's also a process by which if folks for whatever reason don't have the time or money right away to replace the line, they can establish an escrow account to cover the cost of it. So we're trying to build in some flexibility so that folks can, can meet this cost, understanding that there may be folks on fixed income for whom their house is their, their biggest um, sort of nest egg, if you will. John? So I, I feel like I should take my Selectman hat off and go up to the mic, but I, I understand that this is a major issue that we're dealing with, and this is a creative way to take it to deal with it. I don't support this article because I think it's going to cause really a circus in the real estate closing market. Um, people aren't going to know, a lot of people won't know ahead of time, you might not have a realtor from Arlington that is representing you, you're going to sell your house and find out that you have to do this, people are trying, if it, there's going to be a quick close, 
the process of inspecting, finding someone to do the work, then close is going to be a lot quicker than the normal time frame. It's going to hold up a lot of closings. I also think, you know, I've talked to a few local realtors about this, including someone who's one of the most prominent realtors in town who is very involved, who as of two days ago had no idea that this article was being put before us. Now it's going to ultimately be voted on at town meeting. But I think there's a lot of ramifications here and it will just cause a lot of headaches. It's one specific industry and town meeting can determine whether or not that's important enough to not pass the article. But I envision a lot of issues that will come up as a result of having this specific bylaw. And I don't know if you guys can answer this question, but I mean, I've done closings in just about every locality within probably 30 miles of here, and I've never heard of it. Do you know of any other places that have this particular bylaw? So uh, there's nothing that has a water bylaw. The town of Ipswich has a very similar protocol for um, uh, sewer, and then Malden, in part because of a specific problem there, has a more complicated ordinance that speaks to the same idea. So if folks wanted to sort of get a sense and, you know, come back to this issue of whether or not those types of things, what, what the experience is like there, those are two communities that have the closest thing. There's nothing quite like this, but, but, but Ipswich is structurally very, very similar, although it's for sewer and not water. And Malden is, is, is in substance, I, the same idea, but the structure of it's a little different. In, so how would this work for condos? So if, if a condo building has one water line, is it the first one out has to deal with that on behalf of the condo complex? Or, because a lot of condos have one meter for, not the large ones, but some, a lot of condos have Most one meter for, yeah, for multiple units. And then I assume somewhere in this law, we would, once somebody gets the inspection, gets it replaced, the, so, you know, copper pipes should last for a while. It's just, I, I don't feel that this information has been flushed out yet, in addition to my previous concerns. Uh, Doug? So I don't know that this would satisfy uh, all the concerns that Mr. Hertz presented. I mean, the bylaw has a built-in ability for the board to establish additional regulations as necessary. I suppose for a condo, it would obviously depend a little bit on the condo association docs. Usually, I mean, Mr. Hurd probably knows better than I do, but the, when a condo association is formed, it sort of figures out what are the responsibilities of the association and what are the responsibilities of the individual um, unit owners. So I, I, I don't, there's, there, there's also, and I want to be tr totally transparent about this, there are other, you know, things that aren't, like, super easy to work out, which is what happens if there's an all cash, you know, sort of sale. It's harder to use the municipal lien process. Yeah. Um, there probably isn't a perfect way to do this, and I just want to be totally upfront about it. Mr. Rademacher and I had quite clear conversations about that. So that's the best answer. I don't know if yeah. it's really satisfactory, but that's, that's what my position would be if someone were to say. So you're saying, so this would be triggered if we requested an MLC? So the bylaw is the bylaw. The yeah. process by which the town essentially tries to enforce the bylaws through the MLC. Yeah. Now, there are going to be certain cir circumstances where, again, there'd be folks that don't have to go through this whole process, but they still are required to get a certification from the town engineer, and there's penalties for not doing so. Um, how I, I would expect that that's probably, in my mind, that is the weak point of the bylaw in terms of how easy it is to enforce against everybody. I think that the majority of, of, of house sales would be encapsulated by it, but it would be harder to catch certain types of transactions. Right. Because even for, I mean, for a cash deal, we would still get a municipal lien certificate. But, you know, this, this relates to the state law for smoke inspections. Sure. And people in cash deals, it happens all the time. Not so much in Arlington, but most, a lot of time in Boston where they say, oh, we don't need it. It's yeah. a gut or something. We say, yes, it, yes, you do. It's a state law. So people are going to violate it, but, I mean, it just... Oh, someone someone else I'm, um, I'm the tree hugger and the environmentalist. I think it's a great idea. I'm also a condo owner, and my condo docs say nothing about it. I mean, we, we have a pretty nice agreement right now between the guy that rents next door, but, you know, it also might mean that you have to 
rewrite your condo docs. But I still think that we should go forward with it. I think this is the, these urban areas that have very old pipes, <coughs> that they, I mean, Alewife Brook itself would not be as polluted as it was if people were taking care of their pipes. And Somerville and Cambridge are not. I mean, they're, it's going into our, our water body, or half of our water body. <coughs> So I think it's a good, this is a good forward step. So I intend to vote for it. So I can answer one of the questions. So no condo, doc, no condo docs would anticipate a situation like this. No. It would be a common expense that would have to right. be, be paid for by the condo association. But whoever is the first person to sell would it's have to go to the condo association and say, hey, we spent all this yeah. money to replace this water line because I want to sell my house. Right. And if not, then they wouldn't be able to sell their house. So there could be a situation where some a condo owner would be at the behest of the other condo right. unit owners in, in they couldn't sell their house right. and comply with this law. But, I mean, again, just to step back and uh, to my original point, I, I do think this will just cause a lot of headaches that are unforeseen, and I would like to have more input from more members of the real estate community and landowners who... I mean, one person that I spoke to about this said was not in real estate, but she said, oh, I, you know, you're going to raise my taxes. I'm not going to live here, and you're going to hit me on the way out, <laughs> which I don't, is clearly not the intent of this. And I understand why we're doing it, but in order to observe, absorb some of these costs, I think it's other avenues to do it. DPW has the property transfer fee, which I don't think is one of the only towns that has that. It's $15. We start, I mean, I, I don't think a lot of sellers would be against increasing that to $50 or, or to create more revenue to, sorry. I don't, I'm, mm. I don't understand how that pertains to this. Uh, I, 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 but I mean, if, if the point is that the, the town is losing money from water that they're buying but not billing out, it's a way to help absorb that. But I just think this particular idea hasn't been completely fleshed out yet. I'd like to make a motion move approval. We've got second. a motion and a second. Uh, do you want to finish? I haven't solicited public input yet. Did you want to go, Joe, before or after? Yeah, I wanted to ask just a technical question. Yeah. I actually don't know if it's Doug or Adam or maybe, maybe John. Or would, would there be, I, I realize it would remove the consumer protection portion of this, which I find attractive, but, but would it be feasible to um, uh, attach this instead to the, the certificate of occupancy um, requirements? When somebody is moving? Yeah. That would only be for new construction. It would only be for uh, only new, yeah, it would only be new. Okay. I'm seeing nodding from Doug, so, yeah. I have two words. It's a legal term of art. Doug will note it as caveat emptor. <laughs> that means buyer beware. <laughs> so I, in, we tell this to people, you have a home inspection, just to address the consumer protection aspect of it, is that everyone, we've all, if this, you know, there's consumers that are buying homes, but there's also consumers that own their homes right now. So a lot, this isn't a required inspection, most people don't get it, so you're going to have a lot of people that didn't get the opportunity to be protected by this that are then, because this is really only a one generation law because eventually every house gets <laughs> sold and every water line gets replaced and every water line gets replaced with a copier which, which lasts much longer. Well, but, one of the things I was thinking from because of this was I'd like to have um, the DPW look at my pipes and both the water and the sewer line. Um, you know, if I were about to sell my house, I think I'd want to know that in advance. So that's, just, I mean, that, that I think is a very smart thing to do. I'm sorry. Yep. You know what, there's yeah. people waiting. Uh, Mike, why don't you take a seat just for a second? Let me see. Is there anyone here from the public who wishes to speak on this issue? Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, 56 Adam Street. I, I believe I was probably the uh, resident that Mr. Watermark has spoke to today about this. Um, I appreciate that uh, he clarified the limit of the homeowner's responsibility, and I hope the regulation will reflect that, because indeed 
uh, as is typical in most towns, the homeowner only is responsible up to the, the curb stop. Um, I have concerns about the inspection process, though, um, while recognizing the town's interest in not having leaky you know, water, um, water leaking underneath the street. Um, I, there hasn't been any discussion of how much it's going to cost the homeowner just for the inspection. I believe the question I heard earlier was related to the water line replacement. And frankly, having spoken to people on my street who have had it done recently, I think uh, Mr. Rodemacher was underestimating what the, what the cost actually is. Um, if, this, if the inspection is going to be done by a private plumber, um, you know, we haven't heard any discussion of what that cost is going to be. Is it going to be $100? Is it going to be $500? Is it going to be $1,000? Um, and as it gets higher, it seems to me it makes more sense um, not to base the replacement on the inspection, but on some particular schedule. If it's the iron pipes that are the problem, why don't you just say, you know, any house that has a service older than 50 years needs to have the, the pipe replaced, and then you save the people the problem of having to do the, and the cost of having to do the inspection. Um, and I also didn't see in the regulation any exemption from the inspection for houses that have recently had the water line replaced. You know, a lot of houses, uh, at least in my neighborhood, are doing it as part of the water meter replacement. I don't see why those people should have to, again, pay for another, uh, or pay for an inspection a year or two from now when they sell their house. Um, so in any case, I think there, sh there should be some exemption for houses that have relatively new, um, you know, water lines, unless there's some real evidence that, that there is a, um, a leak and, and indeed if it's just going to be a, a visual inspection I would suggest it should be more on the order of what say the fire department does looking for smoke detectors and CO detectors where it's a nominal fee that, that the homeowner um, you know has to pay rather than you know an expense of a private um, private trade doing the work and, and finally I as Mr. Hurd was saying I, I do see this as well, largely a matter between the buyer and the seller and I think, uh, I don't think the seller should necessarily be required to pay for this. I think that should be a matter of negotiation, even if the line needs to be replaced. And I think that's something that needs to be incorporated into the, um, the regulations to allow that as a possibility. Thank you. Um, further questions or thoughts? I, uh, I am, so Mike or Doug, um, I am curious about uh, the universe of inspections done. Like, is it uh, so? You know, is it what? Uh, as well, why is it on every or is it on every sale? Or if or is there a more limited universe that we could attach this to? I think um, if a, a, a plumber could easily identify if you have a copper service, mm -hmm. and then that would pretty much negate needing to go any further. So just basically getting a, some kind of sign off from a plumber that you have a, a copper service. Well, really what we're looking for are the iron services and, 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 and potentially lead, although through our whole process where we've looked at 7,000 water meters so far, we've found one service lead that's lead. So we're, Arlington is fortunate in that regard. So I think what we're really looking for is um, uh, iron services and the condition of them and they're either really corroded uh, and and uh, visually poor in the basement uh, and would warrant replacement or at least let the buyer know they're buying a house with an iron service and then let them negotiate if they want to deal you know with the with in the sales some kind of uh, similar to like a house inspection where you get money off because you're getting something otherwise. You know, we, I think we'd only be looking for it to be replaced if it was visibly um, failing. Um, okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, so we've got a motion. Um, I'm guess, I, I, sorry, where I am is I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I guess I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable right now with the universe. And if I, if we could figure out a way to, but like, I, I, so I'm with the, I'm with the tree hugger. <laughs> I'm sympathetic to the real estate industry, but at the same time, I'm, a, I'm probably like, as far as like leaning to, uh, like lean, lean a little bit more towards the trees, but at the same time, it seems like we don't have to be quite the impact. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I can ask a question, Mr. Rodemacher. Yeah. Mr. Rodemacher, how much, how, how, 
how easy is it for us to access records to say that a water line's been replaced within the last five or 10 years? Um, we probably are not 100% certain. We do have some of those records, but uh, not 100%. Not because one way of limiting it is clearly to just, you know, state that the bylaw shall not apply to, you know, water lines that have been replaced within the last 10 years, and then just ask somebody to provide evidence that that's been the case. That's one way to shrink the universe. It doesn't address all of the concerns, though. Mm -hmm. That does help. I would agree. It does help. Yep. I replaced Here mine with the town, replaced the water. <laughs> uh, yeah, is there a uh, Joe? Do you want to? Wanna... I am. I'm, I'm, I'm so in line with the goal goals of this. Um, I, I just what I've been grasping for is some other trigger for to um, other than the property transfer. I'm not finding it. But we have to vote. We're going to be here all we night. We have to vote. Well, we can we can linger a few right. seconds uh, on the question. <laughs> I see you, Mr. Wagner. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say, as somebody who's replaced uh, Carl Wagner, by the way, Ed Schill. You can, okay, you can pull it down. You just don't want to hold some, it while you talk. Carl Wagner, Ed Schill Road. Uh, as somebody who's replaced my sewer line twice in two houses in Arlington, perhaps you might think about the much more expensive and invasive process of the sewer line if you're going to think at all about water, because water is really cheap to replace compared to sewer. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm leaning towards. But uh, I'm leaning towards, but I do have some lingering concerns here. Yeah. So. Sure. I'd like to add for the record that I'm also in support of the idea of it. I'm certainly not. <laughs> I, I understand that there are really strong concerns that have led to this article being proposed. I just don't, I just foresee a lot of issues, unforeseen issues, if this goes into practice. Okay. Um. Mr. Rodemaker, sorry. So you talked earlier about this database you've got about or that you're developing now with the replacement thing. So you're saying that the like there's five to ten percent or some or maybe it's fifteen, but yeah. it's like whatever that's uh, that's iron, and those are the ones that you're worried about. Uh, does it? Is there a way? Like, does that? Do you really want to inspect the copper one? The one? So the, the, not, no, not no copper. We're not very concerned about the copper. Um, okay. Uh, locations and like I said it, it's, it's very easily identifiable um, visually when someone were to go down um, to determine what the material is but you need somebody to you need a sort of you, you need a plumber to say that or basically you think I, I would be most comfortable with the plumber providing some kind of a letter now I don't know if uh, home, home inspectors are probably trained as well you know I don't know if we can rely on a home <coughs> inspection to give us that information as well. I, don't I just don't, I, if it's in poor shape, I mean, I, a home inspector could let you know if it's <coughs> copper or if it's iron, whether or not uh, it's in a poor enough shape that they would feel comfortable having to work the fittings and uh, the valving and whatnot. Uh, it's a, I'm not sure I would be as comfortable. Okay, you see where I'm trying to drive yeah. at? I'm trying to figure out a way to cut down the burden on this one. Sure. Spe like the, the more that we can rule out of having to impose a burden on, the happier I'd right. be. Right. <coughs> All right. Diane wants us to vote. <laughs> no, I just, sometimes you get to take the hard votes and just right. go for it. I mean, I only made the motion because I didn't even hear anyone making the motion. <coughs> and and who seconded it? Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe. Me. All right, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come down um, with all due respect to, with, as a no and just say, and say, hope that we come to a different way, but I also might lose in this vote because I can't count to three either way right now. No, um, are we ready for a vote? Yeah. All those in favor of the motion in favor by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Ms. Rowe, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. 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 Abstentions. Yes. I'm sorry, I just didn't hear. I said I. You did, so it's yes. three, three to two. Like Correct. a favor. your motion. Yeah. Uh, I simply didn't. No, that's okay. I had to confirm rather than do I was just trying to yep. harmonize with Mrs. Rose's thank you. melodic tone. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Please. Next up, Article 35, Short-Term Rental Regulations. Oh. 
Mr. Chairman, you have before you some draft short-term rental regulations. The legislature quite recently, just because there's a theme about things kind of getting moved very quickly tonight, uh, the legislature just passed this uh, a law authorizing us to further regulate um, short-term rentals like Airbnbs and VRBOs. Uh, recently, the board has already approved the assessment of a short-term uh, rental community impact fee, which is kind of like a extra local excise surcharge almost to try to address the impact fees. Uh, since that time, I've developed some very basic short-term rental regulations. Um, while they're certainly not super concise, uh, they're not necessarily as uh, comprehensive as you might see in some other communities that have a larger short-term rental market. Um, they're primarily oriented around ensuring that zoning, health, safety, and sanitary uh, requirements are, state sanitary code requirements are being met. Um, it's essentially working through this select board office, um, although it doesn't necessarily have to be the select board office. Um, it's fairly, uh, again, fairly straightforward in terms of the scope of it, it's essentially requiring that anybody operating an Airbnb needs to be licensed by the select board to do so and to sort of be on this registry. Um, and it also disqualifies certain types of units, such as affordable housing units, and units that have had multiple violations of a certain kind to try to address. We haven't heard a lot of complaints about short-term rentals, rentals, to my understanding, but the few that we have have been about things like noise, too many cars, and I, I, to my understanding, there's only been like one or two. Is that a fair recollection, Mr. Chairman? I mean, Mr. Uh, Manager? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, that's fair. All right. <laughs> Is that a promotion or a demotion? I think it's a demotion. demotion. <laughs> <laughs> we call him Mr. President sometimes, too. So. Sorry about that. <laughs> no comment. So unless there are any questions, I, I think, you know, they're, they're fairly, meant to be fairly modest, um, but to get the ball rolling on having some sort of you know, way of identifying who is a short-term renter here and some sort of mechanism for saying, listen, you know, you've got to make sure that you're operating this in compliance with, with health and safety codes. Questions for the board? I move approval. We have a motion for approval, Mr. Kiro, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak at this open hearing? Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Next up, Article 41, uh, Arlington Redevelop a boat or Board Membership and Terms. This is a 10 registered voter article. Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti again, 56 Adams Street. Uh, Town Council, I think, gave a, a good description of this article. What it would do is change the current membership of the Redevelopment Board from four members appointed by the town manager with one appointed by the state to four members elected by the voters of Arlington with one continuing to be appointed by the state and setting all of the terms of the members to five years. Um, this article would make the redevelopment board consistent with other redevelopment authorities in towns, all of which have members that are elected except for that one appointed by the, by the state. And it would also be consistent with a lot of planning boards in town which are elected. Just a couple of examples locally are uh, Lexington and Winchester. So the model would actually follow uh, what we have in town for the housing authority, um, where each of the members has a five-year term, there are four elected and, and one appointed. Um, and I mention that just to emphasize the point that what I'm proposing is really nothing unusual. But the real question is why, why even do this? Um, why change it? And I, I see three main reasons. Um, first is I think it makes it more likely that the Redevelopment Board will carry out its responsibilities as a planning board as described by um, state law. And uh, Chapter 40A get, you know, designates both the powers and the responsibilities of planning boards. And I'd like to read uh, or summarize just a few of them for you. One is that um, it shall from time to time make careful studies and when necessary prepare plans of the resources, possibilities, and needs of the town and shall submit uh, such study to the Board of Selectmen. It shall report annually to the town meeting giving information regarding the conditions of the town 
and any plans or proposals for, for its development and estimates of the cost thereof. And it shall make a master plan of such town or such parts or parts thereof as said board may, as said board may deem advisable and from time to time extend or perfect such plan. So we've seen you know, recently where the town has had a, gone through the master planning process. Um, but frankly, I'm not sure I saw the redevelopment board as engaged in that process as I really would have expected. It, it frankly didn't seem to me that they were the ones leading the process. And that, that brings me to the second point, and that I think an elected board would be more responsive to the process. And they, under the state law, they really are the ones that are supposed to be driving planning in town. It's not other boards or, or, the, or the staff departments, or staff in the town departments for that matter. And I would like to see the board be empowered to, um, to really act in that capacity rather than just following the lead either of other boards or their staff and essentially just rubber stamping what's put before them. And I would also like to see a board that really embraces genuine public participation rather than what I see increasingly now is this rather, um, or, you know, having these orchestrated meetings either by staff or outside consultants. Um, and I think an elected board would be much more likely uh, to act in that, in that way. And finally, uh, as I've alluded to, I think the board really needs to be act independently of other boards in the town. The um, Town Manager Act is explicit that the other principal board members, like, like your own board, like the Finance Committee, cannot also serve on the Redevelopment Board. And I think the board act, needs to act that way in practice as well. Um, you know, we saw, I think, the meddling that occurred with your board in the Sims project, and, and frankly, I think that was tremendously damaging both to the redevelopment board itself and to the town. And I think if they were elected, that kind of thing is much less likely to happen. So for all those reasons, I think the town would be better off having an, an appointed board, I mean an elected board, rather than an appointed board for those four members um, that, that, you know, that would be elected. So in closing, I'd, I'd like just to make a couple statements. I think as all of you know, I've served on the redevelopment board myself, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to state publicly for the record that should this pass, I have no intention of running. Uh, should it not pass, I have no intention of seeking, seeking appointment. And I, I'd also like to say, um, or remind you that a few years ago, when I brought a, an article before town meeting that required uh, changing the town manager act as this one would, uh, town council was really helpful in crafting a um, substitute motion to your uh, recommended vote of no action, and I presume you'll, you'll do the same tonight. And I would ask um, or hope that he would be as cooperative this time as well. Thank you. Ms. Rowe. I don't have any trouble with putting this in front of town meeting. I think it's um, uh, an idea. I, you know, I know people on the planning board in Lexington have to be elected. Um, I don't, I think we should go to town meeting with it and let them decide. Is that a motion? Yeah, that's the motion. Second. Questions up here? No, I want to hear from the next. Okay. Uh, it's a public hearing. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak? Uh, yes, please. I'm Carl Wagner. I'm a um, resident on Edge Hill Road and I'm a town meeting member. Um, I heard about Mr. Loretti's uh, uh, motion that you're reviewing. And um, I, I thought about it a little bit, and I, I wanted to add a, a small bit of, of history, and, and, and I think lend my support to it, actually, at the moment. I'm not sure in a different world, in a different Arlington, if I would, but um, we all can remember that we had uh, a treasurer situation where we went from an elected treasurer to a non-elected treasurer. And I think for town meeting and for Arlingtonians watching, the, the, the reason we did that was we felt that it should be a non-political position and it should be a technical position. And at least my, the, the thing that made me vote yes to, to move it to a, a non-elected position was, you know, let the, the powers that be in the town hall and throughout Arlington direct the technical person to do the work that he or she needs to do to do the treasurer's job. And, and I think that's gone very well in, the, in that decision. On the other hand, 
why do you make elected officials elected? When the, the, the taxpayers or the residents or the business owners need to have a voice and they feel they don't have a voice. In other words, when politics are, are involved. And I'm afraid what I've seen at the ARB this year tells me that politics are involved. It should be technical. It should be a gatekeeper for the taxpayers, I would say, because there's a two-thirds vote required in order to change zoning laws for reason, that they're, they themselves, the zoning laws, protect us from radical changes. They make us really get over a burden, a hurdle. In talking with the chair of the ARB, he's told me he's political. He's told me, in, in, in other words, he's told me he's a pro-development person. And everybody should know there are huge development changes that articles being discussed right now in the senior center would, would force on us. And uh, without saying a crisis of confidence in unelected officials, the ARB is one of those groups of unelected officials right now, except that the fifth member is, is put on by the, the state, and that helps. So, so doing something about the problem where taxpayers and residents don't feel that anybody, other than you who don't rule on these, these articles, anybody, uh, th these people don't feel that they have an elected official in Arlington who we can say, don't do this, don't change our town into a city. So that's why I think that, that Ms. Loretti has, has a very valid t temporary or current request to, to bring some accountability to the taxpayers and the residents, of which you are also. So thank you. Questions, comments? Um, you both raised your hand at the same time. <laughs> I just have a logistical question. How would it work to with current members of the board if it was to transition to elected? I've only seen the situation reversed. So there would have to be some uh, element of the special legislation that would provide for when elections would take place. Uh, whether or not that would be based on the full service of the current members' terms or whether it would be different, it's in detail that have to be ironed out in the special legislation in terms of when um, the first election essentially takes place, whether it's staggered in some way, shape, or form. It's a little bit different. I, I, to be honest, you have to look a little bit more into it because it's a little bit different than the converse, yep. right, where you know that you're going to wait for the elected term to expire. I don't know if Mr. Lodi has thoughts on that specific piece of things, but it certainly would have to be part of the act itself saying this is when it takes effect. Okay. Do you have a specific plan? Um, I, I wouldn't say a specific plan, but I, I, I would want it to um, conform to um, the state law for operation agencies where um, only one person is elected each year, so you get staggered terms. So you've got five members on the board, four of whom were elected. Um, so you're only, you're only electing one person each year. Um, but how, what exactly happens to the people on the board right now, I think is something that needs, you know, I need to think about a bit more. Yeah. And uh, town council, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we don't actually have to decide that. In, like, so even if we choose to go forward, we can suggest uh, the form of the motion th that Doug would prepare would say, move forward, um, seek special uh, uh, the home rule legisl legislation. But we don't actually have to draft that legislation as a part of the town meeting vote. Is that? Uh, yeah, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. We don't have to have every detail in it, but we should have enough such that town meeting is basically saying to draft something substantially as follows. So okay. it's got to be clear enough that town meeting just knows what the actual meat of it's going to be. There, are, there is some flexibility one between okay. the meeting vote and the legislation. Do we have any statistics on precisely or roughly how many yeah. localities are that elected versus I would bet the appointed. MAPC could give us that information for our region. Yeah, I think we could, we could get that fairly easily. Yeah. So we can definitely get you the planning board elected versus appointed. Yeah. Arlington as a redevelopment authority is an unusual creature. Um, there are a few other entities that are structured in a similar way where they're both a redevelopment authority and a planning board. But those are mostly, um, to my understanding, cities with sort of high, like Boston has a redevelopment board that's hard to base anything on what Boston redevelopment board is like, but uh, agencies like. Um, so uh, we could get you the information on planning boards very easily. Um, uh, redevelopment authorities, it, it's, it's the ARB is an unusual entity. One of the things I think that we should double check is if we were to change this, um, I know that our participation in the CBDG um, grant program may be affected by that. If I'm remembering an old 
Would, would you just double check that? Yeah. Not, yes. Thank you. So, Joe, Not that I understand it's going to be. Joe, yeah, sorry. Um, going to be eliminated next year, according to our president. <laughs> Joe. So, um, many years ago, I, I wrote a guest commentary to the to the uh, advocate. Um, um, supporting the idea of, of, of moving the, the ARB to an elected board. Um, now, I'm going to tell you that in retrospect, that was because I was, I didn't like some of the decisions. <laughs> uh, just as plain as that. I didn't, Could have been the hill? I didn't like some of the, the I didn't like some of the decisions um, at that time. <laughs> and I've come to appreciate the fact that the, that the ARB does have a balance of, um, you know, professional skills and um, and talents, and, we, and I think the manager's done a good job of trying to maintain that uh, balance and, and bring forth excellent candidates. Um, I've come in, like, I came in tonight kind of with a change of heart, kind of like Mr. Wagner changed his heart on, on time limits, um, feeling that... And gas stations. Uh, gas stations. Like, one thing that's disturbed me while I've been on this board is how often the legitimacy of the ARB has been challenged with what I feel are unfounded accusations of political interference on our, on our part. Um, I can't remember the last time I've actually talked to an, an ARB member, and I'm embarrassed to say that I'm trying to remember who all five of them are, and I'm forgetting <laughs> exactly. the fifth. I'm sitting here saying, who is, who is number five? Um, Honestly, the, the, the ARB member I probably have spoken most to in history is you, Mr. Loretti, when you were on. <clears throat> that, that said, as I sit here and I, and I mull this over, and one of the tricky things with this, this combined board that we have, having the redevelopment um, uh, powers and, and the planning powers, is that there, there's significant policy that is made. The significant policy that's made in recommendations to um, town meeting and um, that, that's always been kind of our yardstick, too, when we've come, come here and kind of considered these, these questions, when we've um, considered the, the treasurer's position um, and other positions, whether they, they merited um, going to the voters or not. I mean, I, I guess I'm willing to go with the motion and, and bring it to town meeting and see what they have to say. I will, <laughs> I will say be careful what you ask for, though, because, you know, if this is being motivated by, as it was with me, disgruntlement over mm -hmm. specific decisions, you may find that the folks who are elected don't agree with, with you. And is there going to be an attempt to uh, delegitimize the, 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 um, the ARB then, say, well, they're politically in the pockets of whoever supported them in their campaigns? And also, does it, does it, um, does it discourage introverts who may have excellent technical skills, who, who, who um, would like to serve in these mm -hmm. positions? I suppose you could say that about any of ours. Um, so although I, I came in here tonight uh, prepared to vote against this because I do value that technical balance, I think on that yardstick of, of, of participating in policy, um, I think it's important. And I think this has come out this year in the select board debate. I watched the ACMI debate the other night. Ours last year, we find select board candidates constantly being asked about zoning measures. Yeah. It's not our, not our purview. Yeah. It's ARP. So. so I haven't gone yet. No, yeah. no I'm not. Okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> yawning. All right. No, I, I was trying to disguise it as a motion. Right. Uh, there motion. are. Uh, I really do like being char chair, but there are times where I it causes me great pain, <laughs> where I bite off tips of my tongue while I wait for everyone to go when I have a fairly <laughs> strong opinion. Um, I do not think that this is a good idea, and I do not endorse it. And I will be voting against it. Um, I think that the sentiment that the town meeting will decide is a foregone conclusion because it's on the warrant. Town meeting absolutely will decide. 
What we're, decide, what we're voting about tonight no, is I not see. whether or not okay. town meeting will decide. We're voting about whether or not we think That's this true. is a good idea. And I do not think it is a good idea. I think that uh, the idea that making something elected will make it less political is foolhardy. I really think that it is the, that election is the most political act that there is. And so I don't think that it uh, reduces uh, the, the political. And I do think that, um, as Mr. Kira su suggests, that uh, a lot of times that, like, you know, if you don't, like, you know, there, there are a number, I can, the number of appointed officials where it's some, like that have had people come to me and say, Dan, we should make, or excuse me, elected officials, we should have come make this be appointed. And really what you need to do is just get someone to run against that candidate. And uh, I would point to the lack of competition that we have for the housing authority and the assessors. Yeah. And I'd say that I don't think that making it elected is actually going to provide uh, the choice that we're looking for. And I think that the other comment about the, uh, what are the skills do we want ARB members to have? Do we want them to be good at running campaigns? Do we want them to have good politi uh, politicians? Or do we want them to be uh, good arbiters uh, is, is the criteria. And um, so we as a board are of course elected. So the, you know, you could say, Dan, why are you hypocritically, I mean, I'm not suggesting that we should be appointed uh, by somebody because I do think there is, and I do think that as the, you know, the, the, the leaders on one end of the table, it does make sense that we do have to have political skills and we do have to have an ability to run a campaign because we have to seek the uh, consent of the people, you know, before we get on the board. But uh, so for all these, uh, you know, I, I could go on, but I think I've hit my high points. I'm, if you can guess, I'm yeah. voting no on the motion as proposed. Okay, I'm going to withdraw my motion. Ms. Mahan. I'll take that. All right. So there is no motion on the table. No action. We have a motion of no action by Mrs. Mahan. Is there a second for Mrs. Mahan's no action? <laughs> yeah. yes. I'm having visions yes. of 1999. Yes. As a courtesy, you usually second. Yeah, no, one I know. I'll second it. I'll second it. Yes, 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 yes. All right. I'm sorry, Ma Mahan. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's the ghosts of Selectman Pass. Uh, so we have a motion, Mrs. Mahan, second. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not. I really did. You know, so now sorry. we have a new motion. Is there a further discussion? My thing is either we're going to vote for it or against it. There was a four. It was coming to town meeting anyway. Yeah. So that's true. And we that is true. Somebody jinxed us by saying how, what the length of this meeting would be. But anyways, <laughs> it's either one or the other. You now have the other. Yeah. I would say there is more information that I would like to hear on it, Great. but which we can, and I accept that, and uh, it will be flushed out at a town meeting. I mean, I think the board works great right now. You know, I have no complaints about anyone on the board or the decisions that they make. It's just that as we hear this article and know that the ARB is doing parallel hearings for certain articles that will go before town meeting, it, it has the indicia of an elected board that I think, for me, you know, I'm going to, I'm on the, I, I, it's not one that, the last one I was very vehemently against, this one I'm not, you know, convinced either way, but, you know, I do think there is enough, like I said again, not that we have to go by every other town, but it would be good for me to know what the trend is in the Commonwealth as far as these types of boards, but since we don't have those, that information, I'm just going off of what I feel is, yep. you know, the, the role of this board, uh, of the ARB, has indicia of an elected board, and so I'm going to support it. I think if you look at the other boards, like, it's going to be hard to tease out because ours is so unique. It's going to be, like, the data is going to be, you can, draw, you can draw inferences, but it's not on yep. point. All right. We have a motion of no action by Mrs. Mahan, second by Mr. Kuro on the floor. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of no action, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Abstaining. Where were you, Mr. Kuro? I'm sorry. You're an aye. Thank you. So it's a four to one vote uh, in favor of no action. Thank you. The Next. Ghost, the sorry. ghost of... Al McLennan came and sat on my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, endorsement of parking benefit district expenditures. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so this is a matter that will have the main motion come from the Finance Committee, but certainly want the backing of the Select Board. Uh, the numbers that are before you have been uh, vetted and approved by uh, the Parking Implementation and Governance Committee, and they have been provided to the Finance Committee and the Capital Planning Committee, who we've had meetings with, and uh, I believe on actually Wednesday night we'll be making their recommendations to the Finance Committee on this matter. So what we're asking for this year is taking uh, basically rollover or leftover monies from the first allocation of the Parking Benefit District, uh, which a total leftover is $36,500. Coupling that with what we uh, now know is available for FY20 uh, in the amount of $150,000 and asking for support to put $186,500 towards sidewalk replacements in Arlington Center. Uh, right now, we've used some of that supplemental Chapter 90 money um, that we announced maybe four or five months ago uh, that the governor had released. Uh, he released $40 million in excess Chapter 90 money. Uh, we've used half of that to hire a design firm to design sidewalk improvements from Pond Lane up to the intersection of Mass Mill, uh, excuse me, Mass Mystic and Pleasant. Uh, so we would be treating that as phase one. We, we've talked about it here before. We, I think we have a common understanding that there may be some trade-offs of replacing the sidewalks now in terms of where what we could gain or lose in terms of moving curbs. But I know I've heard and I think the board has heard a lot of concern from residents about the conditions of the sidewalks, lighting infrastructure in the center. So uh, we'd like to take these monies, uh, couple them with existing sidewalk money in the capital plan as well as existing Chapter 90 money, and hopefully within the next year be able to move forward with sidewalk replacement. Uh, in, again, that stretch from Pond Lane up to the intersection of Mass, Mystic, and Pleasant. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Public Just hearing? Happy. I'm happy to hear <laughs> improvements to sidewalks. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Generational thing. So yeah. uh, seeing not, uh, no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Article 78, we have a Move to table withdrawal. per the proponent's request. I think we would actually more properly oh. recommend no action because we want, as a board, we want to dispose of it, but they don't want to come back till next year. Okay. So it could uh, perhaps a recommend. Do we want to put in our comments that it was per the proponent's request because they want to work on it over the past year versus it's a next no, year. no action? So however you think that gets accomplished. I would say move no action and so dot, moved? Dot, no, dot Second. dotted. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, final votes and comments. Doug. I just want to make one quick note, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I did update the final votes and comments on one specific score. Uh, one of the select board members uh, gave me some feedback, some early feedback, saying that they'd like to have more in the law about the uh, removal of the police chief from civil service. I inserted a footnote that spoke a little bit about the types of laws that help, uh, you know, address that issue. I also uh, addressed a formatting issue that was caught by the select board, so uh, select board's office. So those are the only two changes there, uh, and as well as there was a typo or two in the treasurer um, proposed special legislation. And so the one that has the title revised that includes. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Move approval. Second. Discussion, comments, changes? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. New business. I do nothing other than the Sunday for your um, trivia week. You and I to walk to the town hall. We'll be there. You're going to be there. Yeah, oh yeah. She's looking at me too. <laughs> 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 yeah. You volunteered, remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'll be there. And, and you. S Encourage me. <laughs> yes. I going to say. Arlington <laughs> Education Foundation Spelling Bee. Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. 17th. Yes. Sunday. Here Saint at Patty's Hall. Day. Yeah. Yes. And we if anyone who's clothes? watching, uh, they're, they're really looking for more teams. The deadline okay. is Wednesday. Yes, more teams. Have it. They're really looking for more teams. Well, then we've got a lot of people in the public, right, sitting there waiting, yeah. waiting, yeah. waiting to be press. part of the team. We get some of the... Doug. I have one piece of old new business that I just think that you guys would find fascinating. So in preparation for one of these articles, I had to look at the town meeting notebooks of town council Joe Purcell. If anybody remembers Mr. Purcell. And back in 1971, what they did was they took the warrant, they cut it out, 
pasted it onto pages, and hand wrote out all their notes for 132 articles. Oh my God. So I just, I, I, I was thankful in the moment as I was preparing these things that it's not 132. <laughs> wow. Or they're doing it by hand. They had to do it by hand. Uh, the only new business I'll share is uh, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before was EcoFest here in Town Hall. Uh, and I got to come and spend a few hours uh, in it. I saw something uh, heard there. It was really a great event. Uh, really well, well, well attended with a lot of people passionate about everything that was going on. So uh, just a great event that great people put together every year, and I was glad to be there. I got my compost um, bucket. Nice. Uh, does it? That was all I had. Um, no new big business except I had a great time at the um, policeman, the police um, award ceremony. I always enjoy it, like hearing the stories. Mm -hmm. Captain Flaherty did a good, great job. <coughs> That's it. Ditto. All right. Well, they both have mentioned, but I went to EcoFest as well. We had a great time. My boys had a good time. We made the sing along this year, which they were happy about. Um, and I did get to see a Lime scooter, which I posted and tagged, so maybe we'll see some more on the horizon. Um, and then I also had a great time at the police awards banquet, and my first time, but I would mention that not to derogate from any of our public servants that aren't from the town of Islands, but at both the fire and the police awards dinner, I was, I'm always happy to see that when they call all these names, it's a lot of people that I grew up with or played baseball with or hockey with. And so we really have a great group of people that's comprised of people from the community, which I think leads to why we have such good community policing and fire departments. This morning, uh, the chair and I attended the Long Range Planning Committee. Uh, I'm going to defer to him to give the report. I may provide color commentary. <laughs> <laughs> and I may not. Uh, that's it? That's uh, okay. it. Um, Long Range Planning was as um, exciting as they have been this season, which is not <coughs> something you usually say about uh, Long Range Planning meetings. And uh, I, I think we got real good progress this week from uh, the school department in terms of them fleshing out their asks as it related to the five-year plan and uh, rejiggering the, the, the formula. And uh, it, crystal, if I, it crystallized some things for me, and so I was able to propose um, a calendar, which the, I'm not sure, anyway. Uh, so the next Long Ridge planning is actually Tuesday the 19th, and but at that meeting, Jo before that meeting, Joe and I are going to craft draft commitments that the, for the board. To good, we're going to give those to the long range planning at the 19th, and then uh, I'm sure that they will improve at that meeting on the 19th. And then I'm going to we'll bring them to the, our meeting on the 25th, where I'm sure that they will be um, improved again. And then on Arti on April 8th, which is the first meeting after the election, I'll ask the four of us and the fifth new member to truly approve uh, the commitments. And then uh, that will, is actually also gonna have the impact of triggering, uh, like in, the, in that we're gonna be working with Adam and Sandy to adopt a provisional uh, budget such that, that to be approved at town meeting, such that we'll be in a position to say, if the override is successful on June 11th, we will, uh, this is the budget, and if it, it's not, then that's the budget. So we're going to have essentially two numbers for us to think about at town meeting. And then, of course, that takes us to the pre previously mentioned April 17th meeting where we're actually going to, that'll be the one where we actually create the ballot questions. Sounds good. Who did all the school work? Um, I'm sure it was many of them. Uh, I think uh, Len Cardin has been really instrumental, but I think that there's, uh, I know Kiersey has been working on it a lot. Jennifer Seuss has been working on it a lot. Uh, it's Kiersey also an MP, of course. And, uh, you know, there's a new CFO and Kathy. Yeah, I'll say that, um, you know, one thing, well, I was happy to see a couple of things there with what was produced. I mean, there was actually a concise one page handout that, that Mr. Cardin had done around. The, um, the bucketed priorities and the estimated cost and what they meant 
to the to the system, and I think that's the type of narrative we were looking at. On the other end of the spectrum, um, the CFO brought a, a spreadsheet which laid out the five-year plan for the school department in a format that's very much like the capital budget, Wonderful. which so that you see actually the progression over time of when things are rolled on, and Do I you think that that think is that the rest of the board could get a copy of that. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure we could ask for this. Yeah. That's we had paper for, for that's most That's a of wonderful it. Um, step forward. Um, Mr. Cardin also did an analysis of, um, took a swing an analysis of uh, differentiating the, uh, what costs within the department are fixed and what costs are variable and would be driven by increased enrollment. So I think that, that was helpful as well. Yeah, I agree. I think that was <clears throat> Hi, uh, and also stacking up on whoever the future chair may be um, on the agenda, I inv uh, invited Jeff Dealman uh, to make the, school, the high school building uh, presentation on April 8th, which is our first meeting after that. Mm -hmm. So I've obviously been keeping Marie up on the schedule, and I mean, I'm not the chair to make them, but I'm presuming upon the, the future chair to uh, putting some things on the agenda. I just thought of one thing. There is um, a video, short video, it's about three or four minutes, Adam seen it, about the Mill Brook. And I realized that I want to have it on the agenda for next week. Would that be okay? The 25th. The 25th? Yep. Two weeks? Sounds okay. good. Okay. I want to, I don't know that Glenn Linton, who did it, can be here, but if he can't, then I'll have it in the meeting in April. But it's really excellent. It's, Bob's nodding his head. He's seen it too. It's just great. Very well done. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, our next meeting is uh, March 25th. Vote to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>